Okay, hello everyone, this is Mr. Elberonin here again, and today I present to you the ultimate guide to Demon Slayer Hinokami Chronicles. In this guide we're gonna cover literally everything you could ever want to know, from the absolute basic of basic, to the probably way too in-depth knowledge that you might not ever need to know, but it's pretty cool when you know it. So hopefully from watching this video, even if you're starting off this game and starting off as a complete noob to games in general, or fighting games in general, hopefully by watching this video you'll understand a bunch of the terminology, a bunch of concepts that we use in these games, and so you can really understand and be an expert by the time you've finished this video. Because I know it's going to be a long haul to finish, but trust me, by the time you've watched this, you're going to be an expert on all matters FGC. You're going to know about frame traps, you know, you're going to know what frame data means, you're going to know how long it takes your moves to activate, you're going to know how to link things together, you're going to know everything about this game because, damn, the last 15 minutes of this video is kind of me going on a rant about neutral. A 15 minute rant about neutral, I got unhinged in this guide, I talk about everything you could ever want to know. So, hopefully it is of use to you, and I think I should stop talking now, because every minute that I talk I make this video even longer. Anyways, thanks for clicking on this video, now I am now presenting the ultimate guide to Demon Slayer Hinokami Chronicles, starting from the very, very beginning. Okay, so the absolute basics. Your regular attack string where you just mash the attacks button is accomplished just by pressing square on PlayStation or X on Xbox. You just mash it and you get a full attack string. You can hold upwards to do your aerial attack string that launches the opponent into the air, or hold down to do your grounded attack string, which splats the opponent onto the ground. To do your special moves, it is with the triangle button on PlayStation and Y on Xbox. If you just press the button on its own, It'll do your standing special, or your neutral special as it's called sometimes. If you're moving the movement stick in any direction and you press the special move button, you'll get your tilt special, which is for Tanjiro a water wheel, whereas his standing special where you're not moving the movement stick, you get a waterfall. If you move the movement stick and press special, you get water wheel. If you hold the guard button and press the special move button, once again is triangle, you'll get your guard special, his whirlpool, which is sometimes called a DP, because it's invincible. So for most characters, they're invincible special moves, so you'll want to do it against an opponent when you think they're attacking. You can jump by pressing the jump button, sidestep using whatever you have the sidestep button mapped to, and dash using the same sidestep button. Blocking, you can move the movement stick to push the opponent away, and this just causes the opponent to be further away, and you can even do this while they're attacking, so you can maybe jump away, or you can push them back and then hit them with an invincible special move. Dashing in on the opponent is a good way to get combos, and you can link your attack string into your special moves very easily. Just do any sequence of whatever you like, and it might work. To call out your supports, the default is having the left bumper, and you can call out your support just by tapping it. If you're moving the movement stick, they'll do their tilt special as well. And if you're being hit by the opponent, you can press the support button and they'll break you out of the combo. Pretty cool stuff. And if you hold down the support button, you will turn into your support. And you can even do this during combos. I'm holding down the button now, and you can't even see because of the waterfall, but I am now Nezuko. In this game there are three types of combos. There are yellow combos or orange combos, there are red combos, and there are blue combos, and they all depend on what the first hit of the combo is. So as you can see here, when I just do some normal attacks, I get an orange combo. Even when I start with something like this, or I start with a special move, the most common combo to get is going to be your yellow or orange combo. And it's what you're going to practice most of your BNBs off of. But some attacks give you a red combo, which is a shortened combo. So your armored attack, for example, which I didn't mention, your armor attack is accomplished by doing the movement and the attack button at the same time. So you just tilt and attack button and you'll get your armor attack. That starts a red combo, which is a really short combo and you don't have much time to go for much damage here. So you gotta make sure you keep whatever you do short and sweet. The same applies to most characters' dive kicks. You get a red combo off of that. And there are some special moves that start red combos too. Like Inosuke's Fist Fang Pierce. Some special moves start a blue combo, like Inosuke's tilt special move, 
which is just an even longer combo than your orange combo. Just is more time in your combo, and that's all that these mean. They have nothing to do with the amount of damage you can get in it, just with more time there's probably going to be more damage. You also get a blue combo off of a parry, which is when you tilt the guard button, you do the tilt and the guard button at the same time, then you'll get a parry. All of your special moves and all of your cancels use the blue meter at the top of the screen, so every time you do an attack into a special move, a special move, into a special move, all of it is going to cost you one of those blue bars, but even if you cancel your regular attacks into a jump to get out of the way or cancel into a sidestep, that's going to cost you a bar as well. All the damage that you deal and take in the game is all going to build your super meter at the bottom of the screen, and then when that becomes full, you can either burst, throw an ultimate, which will do more damage depending on the more meter you have, and you can throw a burst, which gives you more damage on your attacks and special moves, and it looks a lot cooler. You get an extra follow-up on your regular attack string. And surge mode is pretty ridiculous. It gives you infinite meter and armor on all of your special moves and attacks. So you get infinite special moves, and they all have armor and do more damage. So it's basically an insta-kill if you hit your opponent in that state. That is the absolute basics of this game. From now on, we're going to move maybe far too into depth on all of the mechanics of the game. <laughs> a really important aspect of this game is the dash mechanic, and it kind of has a lot more facets and nuance than you would have expected from just a regular dash in. So, as it says on face, when you press the dash button, your character dashes in against your opponent, and if you hit your opponent with the dash in, you can get a full combo from it, which is pretty cool. You get a full yellow combo, no, a little bit of extra scaling from the extra hit, but that's about it. Pretty awesome stuff. If your opponent blocks the dash in, you're actually still at advantage. You can attack before they can, after they block your dash in. Isn't that crazy? So, dashing in seems like a pretty amazing option, right? Anytime you want to be in on top of your opponent, boom, pop a dash, and even if they block it, you're still at advantage and it's going to be your turn. And even if they get caught off by guard, they get hit by it and you get a combo. It's a win-win situation and it's a pretty awesome mechanic. And if that's all it was, then yes, it, it would be really awesome. And um, it's free as well. You can do this dash in for free, doesn't cost you anything. You can do it as many times as you'd like. And to add on top of that, you can cancel it at any time. But um, this is where you kind of need to cancel it. It's because if the, if the opponent knows you're going to do a dash in, like I know Inosuke is going to do a dash right now if I put him... So I have the option of doing stuff like my Invincible Whirlpool, or I could do, do an armored attack to counter his dash in, or I could even, if I felt like being a little bit fancy, I could even go for a parry. Which is a little bit of a disrespectful answer, honestly. If you could go for the either, either of the other two easy answers, going for a parry is a little bit, a little bit wow, a little bit rubbing it in the face. But um, yes, if you are predictable with your dashes, the opponent can counter them. But luckily, this doesn't make dashing in any weaker. Dashing in is still crazy powerful because you've got so many options other than just dashing and hitting them with the dash, even though just dashing and hitting them with the dash is really powerful even in itself. It works really powerfully on block and hit, as we said already. But dashing is not just dashing. It is very, very cancelable, surprisingly. You can cancel it into a guard to just completely stop yourself in your tracks and say, whoops, never mind, I don't want to dash anymore. You can cancel your dash into a jump for this really long-reaching jump that flails over the heads of the opponent, which is a really awesome way for getting in on the opponent doing some cool stuff to do some, you know, gymnastics to get over them. You can cancel your dash into a sidestep to jump out of the way of maybe a projectile that's flying towards you. You can cancel it into any sort of special move if you want to dash in and then realize, whoop, throw an invincible DP in there. You can. So it's very, very easy to deal with it, and you can even cancel it into a grab. So if the opponent's standing there just ready to block it, you can just cancel it right straight into a throw. Pretty, pretty awesome, huh? So, honestly, a dash is one of the most powerful things in this game. Even though you can counter it by going for a parry or an armored attack, the hitter has so many options that are able to beat that super easily. Because dashing in, a lot of the time when I dash in, I like to just dash in, 
and then just go for buttons. It makes it a lot safer because I'm just in on the opponent now. And in a guarding state, I have a lot of options in this game. I can push the opponent away, go for a DP. I can go, oh, never mind, they're not doing anything. I can attack now. I can even go, oh, let's actually go for a grab. Or I can go, oh, armor attack. Like, I have a lot of options here. Or I could even just be like, oh, crap, get out of there. If they're doing something like charging up an armor attack. It's it's really powerful, and a dash in is amazing. And, uh, yeah, on a, in the neutral, it's a really awesome attack. And obviously it also can be used to extend combos. Don't want to be using it too much to extend combos. Like you see a few people doing this day one, but I think I think they're gone now. But yeah, you don't want to use it to extend combos like that, but it is really good for extending combos in situations like an up combo. If you want to combo off of something that gives you an aerial attack. Sometimes even you can get a free dash in off certain bounce up attacks. So something like Rui's DP can be actually followed up with a free dash in because it's not dash cancelable, it just happens to leave the opponent airborne for so long that you can dash up. And if the opponent is in hit stun and you dash at them, you will actually perform an aerial dash and you'll track them into the air. Which doesn't usually happen against an airborne opponent. If I have Inosuke jumping here, even if I dash at him while he's in the air... I, ooh, okay, let's try that again. I'll still hit him, but I won't do the aerial thing where I charge into the air and and like go up on top of him so I get to do the you know aerial attack combos and stuff. That only happens with the opponents in hit stun. So if the opponent is being hit or currently in a combo. So if I'm if I call out Inosuke and I'm Zenitsu here, I can get zoom up on top of him and do cool Zenitsu stuff that I failed there. But the point is, if the opponent is being hit and they're airborne, and you can dash up, you'll dash up, and you'll dash up right in front of their face. And not everything in this game is dash cancelable. For example, Tanjiro is actually a very not dash cancelable character. He can't dash cancel his water wheel. He can't dash cancel his waterfall. He can't dash cancel his whirlpool, obviously. So all of his special moves are actually non dash cancelable. Which, in his case, doesn't really matter because they're both, they're all really amazing special moves with their own strengths. But it's just interesting to point out, where a character like Nezuko can dash cancel her heel bash. Or actually, oh, we'll get to that one. But she can dash cancel her crazy scratching at any point, any point, like at the first hit, at the last hit. Anytime during crazy scratching, she can dash cancel and get a combo off of it, which is pretty cool. It's pretty useful and good for pressure, good for combos, good for everything. And then the other kind of cancel the dash that you can get in a combo is off of things that aren't dash cancelable but leave the opponent in the air. Tanjiro still has none of these. Oops, wrong controller. Tanjiro has none of these because he doesn't have any special moves that leaves the opponents in the air. Anytime he dashes at the opponent, they would still be on the ground. The only time he can do this is uh, off of this. But characters like Nezuko have special moves like her heel bash that actually aren't dash cancelable but they leave the opponent in the air for long enough for her to dash in letting her get this free dash in, which is a really amazing thing for any character that can get it. Because it means you get to dash in on the opponent and get aerial attacks for free without having to dash cancel it. So some characters that can do this is Rui after his DP. Susamaru after her DP kick. Akaza can do the same thing off of his DP stomp thing. And Mu after his DP. Zenitsu can do it too, but there are also characters just like Nezuko who can dash cancel things that are just their other special moves that aren't their DP. And uh, yeah, if the opponent, or kind of like Enmu, if the opponent's been blasted into the air by one of his balls, he can just dash in anytime and then it'll put him into the air and get an air dash cancel. All that stuff's really cool, and those things are really important when you're talking about getting cheap combos, because you get to get those follow-ups a lot more easily, and it adds to a lot of damage, because as we've talked about, aerial attack strings do a lot of damage and they don't scale your combo as much as other things. So if you're ever able to get a free dash in, that's just like good free damage, because you get to get another aerial attack string in your combo, and it's not costing you anything. 
Zenitsu is kind of a great example of this because he can dash cancel for free after a lot of things because he leaves the opponent airborne a lot of time. And uh, yeah, as you can see there, I only did it twice in that combo. His control was a little bit different. But um, he got those dash ups for free, which made his combo a lot more cheaper than it would have been with those dash ups costing meter. Instead of costing the two bars it cost him just to do that simple stuff for a bunch of damage, it would have cost four. So free dash ups are really powerful and they happen once again when it's a non-dash cancelable move that leaves the opponent airborne. But I think that's just about there all there is to say about dash cancels. Obviously, you know, they're good for combos, but they're also really important to use in your pressure and your mix-ups because they are what let you cancel your attacks into a cancelled dash into a grab. And uh, that's the key mix-ups for a lot of characters. If the opponent's ever blocking, just like doing some special move or whatever and cancelling it into a grab is really effective mix-up. So yeah, dash is very powerful, probably one of the most powerful things in this game, so luckily it's universal, but it's great for circumventing the neutral and just going straight in on the opponent and just forcing your advantage. It's great for whether or not it hits the opponent, it's you have an advantage somehow. It's great for mix-ups even from a distance, because you get to trick your opponent to think you're going in for a dash in, or a throw, or an armor attack, or a jump, or whatever. It's great for extending combos. And it's great for allowing you to do mix-ups. It's a, really a one tool makes the game kind of thing. So thank you Dash, but we'll be moving on to the next mechanic. So in this game, like many others, your basic attacks are the foundation of your offense. They're fast, very good for punishes, and they're very easily chained together for simple combos in any situation where you realize you've gotten a hit. An attack string is what you call when you link all of your basic attacks together and it can be executed just by mashing the attack button. On PlayStation, the attack button is square by default, and on Xbox, it is X. And in this game, there are three versions of your attack string that can be done by either holding up or down to do two alternate versions of your attack string. So with Tanjiro, his basic version is just uh, this. He does six hits, and the opponent is left standing. If I hold down during the attack string, it does more damage, but it can't be cancelled into special moves or anything for an extended combo. So it is more useful for ending your combos because it does more damage and knocks the opponent down. Certainly not for combos though. And the up version launches the opponent into the air and does less damage. For some characters, launching the opponent into the air can lead to some really unique and more useful combos. For Tanjiro, not so much the case, but you can still see how it is useful in certain scenarios for alternate combos. So, just to recap that, the standing version does medium damage, but leaves the opponent standing on the ground. When you hold down during the combo, you do more damage, but you don't get a combo. And the up version does less damage, but it launches the opponent into the air for a combo that can fold be followed up with an aerial dash, or whatever your character wants to do. Most of the time though, you're going to be using your standing attack string because it's the most versatile and just best all-round attack string, because it's the easiest to use in combos. And unless you know any particular scenarios when you, you want to be using an aerial combo where you launch the opponent into the air, I don't suggest doing it too often because a lot of the time the reward isn't as great as doing a regular standing attack string combo. If you're doing your attack string from a distance where you're not actually hitting the opponent and you're whiffing all your buttons, you can't actually use your directional input to change the combo and it'll do the straight combo by default. Just the regular standing version and I can't do the down version no matter what I do. In this game, your regular attacks are so powerful not only because they're your fastest button, but they're also so much more versatile than any other option you would have. They're the most cancelable op option you have in the game. And by cancelable, I mean you can cancel your regular attacks into nigh anything. You can cancel them into special moves, all three of your special moves honestly, and you can cancel them into a dash in to extend your combo, and you can even cancel them into movement options like a jump away or a sidestep. Now having those options is really important because it keeps your regular attacks very versatile, very safe and very low commitment. For example, if I accidentally misspace my attacks and I think they'll hit around here, and I'm accidentally just flailing myself around, my opponent could punish me and space me out and do something like a dash in or an armored attack to beat me pressing buttons at a distance where I'm not actually hitting them. And if I realize I'm accidentally doing this, I can just sidestep out of the way before I even get close to my opponent, and I can dodge whatever they try to do to um, counterattack me. In a similar scenario, if I'm doing a combo on my opponent and they decide to break the combo, 
While I'm doing my attack portions, I'm not just stuck there doing my attacks during like a headless chicken. I'm allowed to cancel it at any point into a dash in or anything else I desire, which can be handy for chasing down an opponent that has broken out of my combo. So I'm doing some attacks, the opponent breaks out of my combo, and I can chase them down at any point during my attack string whenever I see they do the breakaway. It helps me from like not giving them any space or any time to do whatever they want. So whenever they're used, your normal attacks are super unpredictable and full of variety. You can cancel them into a dash in that gets cancelled into a grab. You can cancel them into your attacks for a combo. If your opponent's blocking them, they'll never know if you're going to try and jump away to run away from the opponent. They never know if you're going to cancel into a run in. They never know if you're going to cancel into a sidestep and do some tricky loops or whatever. The opponent doesn't know what's going to happen when you're doing a normal attacks because they are so flexible and can be cancelled into anything. And while we're talking about cancelling your attack strings, your, your attack string can actually be delayed in itself. So it's not just fated to be this quick succession attack string, you can, can actually delay the attacks within the attack string slightly. You can actually do it so much that it doesn't even combo. There wasn't enough there. As you saw, I delayed that second swipe, or that fourth swipe, so much that it didn't even connect with the rest of the attack string. Obviously this isn't useful for when you're doing combos, but being able to delay your attacks is very powerful in offense because the opponent thinks you're finished attacking and that if you're doing some stagger pressure like this where you keep attacking and then maybe going in for grabs, the opponent doesn't know when you're finished attacking if you're delaying your attacks because it looks like you're done, but then you're actually still attacking them and if they try to jump away or walk away or mash buttons on you, they'll get hit because you're not actually finished your attack string and you can still beat them even though it seems like you're finished. In a situation where you're finished, like this, you could have gone for a grab or something and if the opponent was expecting that, they would jump out of the way, but if they tried to jump on your delayed attacks, they'd actually just get hit and then you get to go into a full combo and they'd not die. The first few hits in your attack string are safe, whereas the last and second last hit are generally unsafe. However, this won't usually be a problem, because if you're ever doing a full attack string, even on a blocking opponent, you're probably always going to be cancelling it into literally anything else, into a special move, into some pressure, into grabs, so it's never really a problem, but good to keep in mind that you can press the first few hits of your attack string and you're completely safe doing so, but the more you press, if you just leave it blank like that, you can be punished for it. Speaking of punishes, your regular attacks are the best way of doing so, so if Inosuke is doing some attacks on me, and maybe he's done a few too many attacks, I can easily punish him for doing that, if he doesn't cancel it into anything else, or if he cancels it into something that's unsafe, and just does something silly like his boar rush, that's a super easy punish and I can punish it very easily with my regular attacks. However, there are circumstances in the game where your regular attack might not hit. My regular attack does not reach far enough to be able to hit him, but there is a way you can somewhat circumvent this. You can actually make your regular attack reach even further if you hold a, your movement stick while you press the attack button. So as you can see, around this distance, I would not usually be able to hit the opponent with my attack. But if I'm just holding the movement button either towards or away or sideways, it doesn't matter, Tanjiro would take an extra step forward during his attack to make it go a little bit further. This does make it tiny, tiny bit slower, but it gives it a lot more range than it would normally have. As you can see, I'm walking around Inosuke, I'm not running in towards him, but at this distance, just because I'm holding sideways and I'm holding the movement stick, I'm able to do the full dash in attack, or the, the step in attack, just because I'm holding the movement stick. It adds a lot more range to your attack, and it makes it only a few frames slower, so it's good for getting a punish in on attacks that leave you a little bit too far away for a regular attack to punish. So, for recap on your normal attacks, they are very fast, easily chained together just by mashing the attack button, and there are three versions of it. You can either hold the up button to launch the opponent into the air, but do a little less damage, or you can hold the down button to do more damage, but end the combo and not be able to follow up afterwards. And your down attack string leads to a short, hard knockdown where you have a little bit of time where the opponent will just stay there in front of you, you have some time to stand still and build some meter, but not for too long like some other hard knockdowns. Your basic attacks are great for punishes, and they can be great for further ranged punishes if you hold the movement button, you will do a step in attack and you'll be able to reach a little bit further. Your normal attacks can be cancelled into special moves, into any movement options like your dash in, jump or sidestep. They're a very versatile, very low commitment option. The first few hits of your attack string are safe, 
while the last few are not. And you can delay your attack string to gimmick out your opponent whether you're going to be going in for a stagger or just going in for a delayed attack string. And although I said your regular attacks are very good for combos, because they definitely are, they can be linked into basically anything, so they give you a huge variety, and they act very well as glue for your combos, because you can cancel them into anything. But the regular attacks on their own are actually really poor portions of combos, because the regular attacks themselves actually scale the combo a lot. So as you saw, this combo was very long, had a lot of hits in it, and cost me a bunch of meter, but it did really, really low damage. And that's just because it consisted of regular attacks. You can spend as much meter as you want, but the more regular attacks you do, the more your combo will scale, meaning every attack does less damage. The more regular attacks you do, the less damage you get later on in the combo. I'll explain scaling more later on in the video, but for now, just know that the more regular attacks you do in a combo, generally the, more, the less damage you're going to get for spending the same amount of meter. So if you are wanting to get optimal damage off of your punish, you're going to want to do as few regular attacks as possible, especially in the early portions of a combo. But in regular scenarios, that just isn't feasible, and using the high hit confirmability of being able to just smash the attack string and then realize, oh, I'm hitting my opponent now, now I have time to go in for a full combo, and I can now actually throw meter on in the combo and now it makes sense. So just make sure you're keeping in mind that you're not using too many attacks, but make sure you you know, don't just try and use zero, because if you just are always trying to do a single attack into a special move, there's a chance that the opponent's going to block that, and you're just going to be wasting meter for no reason. So make sure you're just throwing out attacks. If you realize they're hitting, cancel into your special move and go into your combos as soon as you can, but don't do it at the jeopardy of wasting meter. So. A regular attack that I didn't mention in my normal attack string segment is my aerial attack. And I'm mentioning them on their own for a reason, because they are so unique and so different than your regular regular attacks, and they, they do a lot of different stuff. So, obviously, your aerial attack string in the air is a few hits, and the last hit bounces your opponent. This is the same for all characters, whether they have a few hits into it or just a single hit like Tanjiro, you do a few hits, and then your opponent gets bounced onto the ground. It's only two segments, so you have your aerial attack, and then your aerial attack follow-up is just when you press the attack button again, and your opponent will do the flip- I mean, you'll, your character will do the flip kick and bounce the opponent. So, your aerial attacks are honestly really, really good for combos, because they do a lot of damage, they bounce the opponent, so they extend combos, and they don't scale as much as your regular grounded attacks, so they do more damage, and just lead to more damage in the long run. So if you're ever able to start your combo with your aerial attacks, as such... You'll see you're able to get a lot of damage for less meter than you usually would. So they're very powerful, and they do a lot of damage. So just like your grounded attacks, your aerial attack string is very special cancelable. You can cancel it into literally any action you can do in the air. You can cancel it into a sidestep, you can cancel it into your special moves, but like I said, they have to be air available. So you can't do your DP in the air, so you're not going to be able to cancel that, and you can't do another jump in the air or a dash in the air, so you can't do those either. However, a new option you have available in the air is your dive kick, and that can actually be cancelled out of the first hit, of your aerial attack string. After the second half, you cannot cancel into your dive kick, so just make sure if you want to go for a dive kick, you're doing it early enough. And this is actually really handy, because then you can use your aerial attacks in an area where you usually wouldn't hit the opponent. So like, if you jump at me, I'm gonna slice you out of the air, but even if I miss here, I can do a dive kick and kind of keep myself safe and even go in and hit you, depending on how close you are. So having the option to just be in the air and go for a dive kick is really handy because then it kind of keeps you unpredictable, like am I just going to fall down or am I going to fall down and then do a dive kick and snipe you? It's very handy. And I guess while we're on the mention, on the topic of mentioning your aerial attacks, your dive kick is an aerial attack you can do on its own. It starts a red combo, so you're not going to want to do it too often. I mean, if it works, sure, damage is damage. But, um... Just keep in mind that getting any other kind of hit will lead to more damage, so if you get an aerial water wheel or something, that'll start a yellow combo, or if you get an air just an aerial attack into your dive kick, you can start a yellow combo that way. 
but it is a very good movement and attack option because if you're jumping in situations like this the opponent's like there's no way you can hit me from there with your regular attacks but in those situations a dive kick still can they're very good if you jump over the opponent's attack and the opponent goes flying underneath you you can catch them with your dive kick they just dive kicks are good in any game they change your trajectory and they go in flying at the opponent it's just a very very powerful way of maintaining offense do keep in mind though that your dive kick is very punishable. I think for most characters it's very punishable, but obviously it varies. And you can't cancel your your dive kick into other things very quickly if you do whiff it, so do be very, very careful using it if you if it misses the opponent or it's a blocking opponent. You really want to make sure it's a maneuver that if the opponent has pressed a button, you're gonna like dodge it or counter it by doing your dive kick. And your aerial attack string is not just good for starting combos or extending combos, it's also probably one of the best way of ending your combos because it ends in a hard knockdown. So if I just did a simple combo like this, the opponent is stuck on the floor like that for ages and I have tons of time to build some meter. And hard knockdown is really useful because it gives you time to build back a lot of meter in a combo. And the hard knockdown that you get off of your air attack string gives you tons of time to build back lots and lots of meter you may have recklessly used in a combo. So, say for instance, Nezuko here. I can spend tons of meter in my combo recklessly just doing random special move after special move, but as long as I end in my aerial attack string, the opponent is stuck on the ground there hard for ages, and as you can see, just from me standing there, I'm able to build back around a bar and a half of meter before the opponent even stands up, which is basically all the meter I spent in my combo. So obviously you can see that this is very useful in a situation where perhaps perhaps I've spent all my meter in the neutral or I've spent a bunch of meter doing you know combos or whatever previously and I don't have much meter. I have the option of just doing a super simple combo where I just end in a hard knockdown and it will give me tons of time to build back lots and lots of meter before the opponent wakes up so that now when we go on to offense I'm not super low on meter. This is really useful for characters that really like spending meter in their offense, just like Nezuko who loves using crazy scratching and her heal bash which is plus on block and stuff. So if your character really likes spending meter, going for a hard knockdown where you can build like two to three bars of meter at the end of your combo is really powerful and it just allows you to go for a lot more offense. So yes, make sure you're making good use of your regular air attack string. I think that's probably one of the main things I don't see beginners use enough, is make sure you're using it as a really powerful hard knockdown that can give you tons and tons of meter. Make sure you're using it as a combo extender, or even see if you can use it to start your combo. See if you can air, like, jump sidestep in and hit your opponent with some of these, because this can lead to some really big damage for really simple stuff. Okay, so the next keystone of offense is obviously going to be your armored attack. Now, in this game, your armored attack is executed just by pressing the movement button and your attack button at the same time. So if I just go blah, 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 and then press my attack button, I should get an armor attack out. So I just tilt it and press it, I get my armor attack. Now, in this game, armored attacks can be easily comboed off of by most people. See Tundra, I can just do my armored attack. Do a few hits into a special move and I get a pretty okay chunk of damage. You're never going to get huge damage or generally you're not going to get huge damage off of your armored attack because it starts a red combo and your combo red combos are just shorter so you're not going to have as much time to go for high damage in your combo. Luckily it doesn't scale your combo much though. You can hold down your red attack so that it does even more damage and more damage more fun but holding it down, although it makes it slower, it does actually make it break an opponent's guard. So as you can see, Inosuke there foolishly just stood there and guarded the whole thing. He got his guard broken and I get to go in for a full combo for free. One useful thing about holding your armor attack down is that you can actually cancel it while you're holding it. So I can cancel it into a sidestep or cancel out of it into a jump or cancel out of it into a dash in. Now this is really handy because you can go to go for an armor attack and hold it down a little bit just to see, just to like wade the waters and see what's going on. I can go for an armor attack and like, oh, you know, Oske is mashing buttons. Okay, I can let it rip and I'll armor through him and go for a combo. Um, but if I see he's kind of being like, being careful and like just walking or like jumping away or just blocking and he's like not going to get hit by my armor attack, like maybe he's just stepping out of the range and just waiting for me to let it rip. 
I obviously don't want to just like do this and then get punished for doing it randomly in neutral, so I can just be holding it down and just cancel it into a dash in and catch him off guard trying to watch me. So that is very powerful. And honestly, that's about all armored attacks is used for. Obviously, as armored attacks, they're very good as counter attacks. So if Inosuke was attacking me, I can easily just do a pushback and go in for an armored attack. Whoops, that was not very quick. And go for in for an armor attack, and I can armor through whatever he throws at me at any point during an attack stream. You're gonna see people doing this a lot online because it's just really easy to push the opponent back, go for an armor attack, and you'll armor through their attack string, and hopefully you'll get the hit, and you get a bit of damage for them trying to attack you. Now, unlike invincible special moves like Tanjiro's Whirlpool, armor attacks do actually take damage. So if I am doing the armor attack and holding it down and Inosuke is mashing on me, I will be taking a little bit of damage, but compared to the amount of damage you do on the opponent, it doesn't really matter. So don't worry if the opponent hits you while you're charging it up, because you're going to get the hit on them and they'll take a lot more damage. The only place where this really starts to matter is when you're nearly dead and you only have a little pixel of life yet. You don't really want to go for an armor attack, because if the opponent just does anything, it doesn't matter if you have you've made the read that they press a button and you do an armored attack to counter them, their attack is still going to hurt you enough to kill you and you're just going to die and it's going to be very awkward. So make sure you're just keeping keeping check on how much life you have and don't use this when you have literally nearly no life because it's not going to be very useful for you. And although I said you generally won't get too much damage from an armored attack on its own because it starts a red combo, they can actually be really useful ways of adding damage into combos. So say here when I've done a combo with Tanjiro with the waterfall, I can actually throw an armor attack in there because I have so much time where the opponent's just falling down. I can throw an armor attack and that just adds a little extra big chunk of damage where I can, you know, just get some some more damage in my combo. It's like a free special move basically. It's a nice extra bit of damage. It does more than my regular attacks and it doesn't scale as much. So if you are a character that has really long knockdowns and get, that has time to go for armor attacks in combos, that can be really, really handy. And the last keystone of offense is obviously a grab, your unblockable attack. So, in this game, grabs are obviously unblockable, but they are not all built the same. So, for example, where Tanjiro's would obviously not hit, Nezuko's will easily cleanly hit because she goes so far. In this game, grabs can range in distance that they hit, in the speed that they activate, and in the damage that they do, and in the knockdown that they bring afterwards. So Nezuko's is basically the best of all worlds. It does good damage, it does high damage for a grab, it reaches really far, it's quite fast, and it leaves the opponent knocked down right in front of her. For some characters, this is not the case. Like Tanjiro's, he doesn't reach as far, he's a little bit slower than Nezuko, and he doesn't leave the opponent knocked down right in front of him, he launches him further away, but some characters don't even get any hard knockdown at all, and it really just depends on the character, so test it yourself. So, as you would expect, grabs are obviously the main point of mix-ups in this game, because there's not really any way of getting overheads or lows or cross-ups or really mixing up in any other way, so you're pretty safe to stand there guarding most of the time in this game, but not if the opponent's going in for a grab. So grabs obviously have that signature little flash of like that, that whirlpool flash of blue that goes inwards to show that you're going for a grab and to show the opponent they need to get the hell out of there. So grabs can be implemented in mix-ups in numerous ways. If I just put the opponent so they're just standing here guarding all the time. Uh, if I'm just attacking my opponent, I can actually cancel into a run. And you can actually cancel a run into a grab. So just whenever you're doing the run, just hold the guard button. So just press the run button and then press the guard button and then right after you've pressed the guard button just mash the attack button and you'll cancel it into a grab. And in attack strings that is really handy because you c the opponent thinks they're just standing there blocking all your stuff and then boom you've cancelled into a grab. For some characters they can even make this really interesting in their special moves. Like Nezuko who's doing these cr like crazy scratching, she can cancel into a grab there. And her grab is really fast with all those particles on the screen there's no way the opponent sees that coming. Um, if I do it from further- oops. She doesn't even have to do it off of the last hit of Crazy Scratching. She can cancel it before the end and just 
snipe the opponent out of just standing there and blocking and make them really, really scared to block anything you do. So grabs are pretty powerful in this game, especially if you're a privileged character like Nezuko to have an amazing one that can just pop out any time so fast from any distance. Oh god, don't get me started on Enmus. But yeah, grabs are powerful, make sure you're using a lot of them or else the opponent's just going to get too comfortable with anything you're doing that they can just stand there, block and push away. You got to make sure that they they don't do that to you at all. And also grabs are not impacted at all by the pushback, so if the opponent does a pushback and you're doing a grab, the grab will not get pushed back in the slightest. So uh, yeah, grabs are powerful, make sure you use them for mix-ups, you just... Basically, the only way you use them is just whenever you have time to go in for a dash in grab, just do it if the opponent's blocking, and if they start to adjust and react to that, that's when you start adjusting back to them and then start doing the some stagger pressure or some cancelling to special moves or stuff like that. Um, do keep in mind, though, you do need a little bit of distance in between yourself and the opponent to do so. So after the first few hits of the attack string, I can't actually cancel into a grab because I can't actually cancel my run fast enough to, to block, because it just hits, as soon as the run starts, it hits the opponent, so I didn't have any time to cancel it. So there does have to be a little bit of a gap, and with Tanjiro, he has to do his full attack string in order to have that gap. Other characters are different, other characters you can cancel it after the third hit, and the fourth hit, and not just the last hit. Um, like an example, like Nezuko, she has... Unfortunately, the same issue where she can't really do it before the end, but she can do it off of her um, alternate attack strings, like her down attack string, and there's all that rocks on the screen and stuff, so it's really hard to see the grab coming in. But yeah, as long as there's a little bit of space in between you and your opponent, and you have the ability to cancel whatever move you're doing into a run, you have the option of cancelling into a dash grab. Good mix-ups, and that's the main way you're going to be implementing grabs into your offense. Also, obviously, you're going to be implementing grabs off of your support covering you, and then as the su support is attacking the opponent, you run in and do a grab. This is pretty staple. Like, if the opponent, if you just summon your support from full screen, and then the opponent stands there and blocks them, then you run in and do a grab. It's pretty, pretty s simple stuff. You see it a lot online. So just make sure if the opponent summons a support from full screen, you don't just stand there and block it, because you kind of might just get stuck and get stuck into a forced grab scenario. Unless you're Tanjiro and you just missed twice in a row for some reason. Also, unlike other games, grabs in this game just hit whenever. They can hit an airborne opponent, which is not normal for games. Usually it has to be a grounded opponent. So even if the opponent like is in the early frames of their jump and have just left the floor, maybe they're close to the floor again after landing, you will be able to hit them with a grab, which is something I don't really agree with, but it's just part of the game. So yeah, you can hit airborne opponents with a grab, and opponents that are stuck in stun can be hit with a grab. So as you saw before, like even while Nezuko is currently attacking the opponent, I can just hit him with a grab literally at any time, which just isn't really how you grabs usually work in games. And uh... Yeah, just makes them a little bit more powerful and more scary, so you've got to make sure if you're ever blocking the opponent, you've got to push them back and try and get away if you're blocking a sidekick, because there's just no way of avoiding the grab in this scenario. It's kind of, kind of crazy. <laughs> so another pretty big part of offense in this game is supports, because there is kind of a lot of things you can do with your support gauge. Obviously, click the button, brings out your support, they attack the opponent. Seems pretty simple, right? Except for when you factor in that... There's a lot more than that. So, not only can you just tap the button to bring out your support, just summon them, attack the opponent. If you tilt press the button, like use the movement stick, your opponent, your sidekick will do a different attack. So as you can see, Nezuko there did a heal bash instead of the regular crazy claws that she does. So you can control what attack they do, but you can also hold down the button to switch out with them. Which, unlike poor One Justice 2, you can do in this game. So, switching out with your character allows you to switch up your offense, because obviously you're completely changing out character. But the switch out itself can also be a really handy technique, because like, in situations like this, where I'm just attacking the opponent, I can summon Nezuko, or I can turn into Nezuko while Tanjiro is still attacking, and go for my grab, even while Tanjiro is still doing his stuff. Which is pretty crazy. And if you do it too quickly, it can become too weird, because there's three characters on the screen. But it's pretty amazing that I can change characters halfway through a sequence just to keep it going. Like, I could even just keep doing more attacks if I wanted to. And then go in for a grab at the very end. So the actual side switch can be really cool as well. 
And then obviously the last thing you can do is use your sidekick meter to break combos, which is one of the mainly often uh, defensive things you can do with your sidekick meter. They can save you from being hit from your opponent because maybe you did something stupid and the opponent is punishing you. You can spend all of your sidekick meter to save you from that combo. Pretty powerful stuff, right? So even with just those three options, the summoning the support, turning into the support, and using the support to save you, you've got a lot of really cool things you can do that cover a lot of different kind of circumstances. So obviously one of them is using your support in combos, and Shinobu is a character who really, really benefits from this, because she can combo off of her DP special move that poisons the opponent and get a lot of damage if she uses Nezuko support after that to extend off of it, because she usually can't extend off of it, and it gives her a lot more damage than she usually can. But even Tanjiro has ways of using Nezuko to extend his combos, to just make everything he does even a little bit more scary, as if it wasn't scary enough. But unlike Shinobu, Tanjiro actually does fine without using Nezuko in the combos, so a lot of the time characters like Tanjiro don't feel the need to spend all of their sidekick age on using the sidekick for combos, because they can use it for a lot more. For instance, the cool thing you can do is after a hard knockdown, you can have the opponent wake up into a sidekick, so they have to wake up and like just stand there blocking your sidekick if you summon the sidekick as they wake up. So you can use your sidekick as a tool for Okizeme. So see, Inosuke is waking up and waking up into Nezuko and getting comboed by Tanjiro. And another option is obviously just summoning the sidekick from full screen. Like if you're over here, that's the only like projectile-ish thing that Tanjiro can do to attack from this distance without having himself go in. So we can summon Nezuko, see that like, oh damn, he actually got hit by that, and then get to go in and do some damage of my own. So it's pretty awesome that you can have such long range things, and you can even just use them as a front to go in yourself, because then you're behind the support as they attack the opponent, and it's pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty handy way of getting in on the opponent pretty easily. And then, obviously, just in, kind of similar to that situation, you can call out your support in the middle of your offense just to make your offense super ridiculous looking, like having two characters attacking you at once is horrifically terrifying and you're basically bound to get grabbed at some point. Now, the same can kind of also be said for the sidekick switch, because as we mentioned before, switching sidekicks in the middle of a sequence is kind of terrifying because there can be kind of some like literally unseeable block and grab scenarios where like come on there's no way you're blocking against Nezuko doing her full attack string and then Tanjiro just going in for a grab that he missed because of the wall. But uh, you can even use your sidekick switch as a way of extending combos in unique ways and obviously this just depends on the team but with this team you have options of doing kind of this sort of situation, switching out to Nezuko to finish the combo because she's got a little bit of better combo ending potential and you just get a lot more damage than you would have just using a single character. And um, obviously sidekicks can be used for very simple purposes like extending your combos with Shinobu and stuff, but there are also some cool tricks you can use with sidekicks like, for example, you can use them as really good ways of covering yourself in the neutral. So if, for example, something you see a lot of um, high level Zenitsu players doing is just going for something like their Thunderclap Prime, then bringing out a support to either to just cover all the bases, literally. So if the... Mm, Inosuke is a bit of a bad example, but he will do the Thunderclap, and then he brings out a support, and the support should theoretically combo off of the thunderclap really easily and if it the opponent does end up blocking the thunderclap well the thunderclap would usually be blo um punishable but thanks to the support they end up just getting more pressure off of the thunderclap and it ends up being safe if not advantage depending on what support you're using so supports can just be a really good way of almost just making your special move better because if I throw out my water wheel and then bring out Nezuko, it makes me able to come off my water wheel for free, since I call that Nezuko, and my water wheel usually isn't advantageous on block, but thanks to Nezuko it would have been if they had have blocked it. So if you cover, bring them out at the same time, it kind of like super ups your special moves, and it can be, can be pretty cool what kind of awesome stuff that leads to. And um, also another little trick that can be used by your supports is getting your character to do something before you 
turn into your support. So you can kind of, like the main example is kind of using yourself as a projectile. So if I'm Tanjiro, I can dash in on the opponent, then be transforming into Nezuko. So I don't actually dash into the opponent. And then I can actually kind of like do a double dash in, where I get like two characters dashing in at once, and that actually combos I did it so quickly. But um, it's a cool way of like covering the opponent. You get a dash in, and the opponent thinks that's you dashing in, because you did do the dash in, you did the dash in animation, but then you actually just become the character behind the one dashing in. And there are a few little, you know, sneaky things like that you can do, where it seems like, oh, Tanjiro's doing the water wheel, like I gotta punish him, or if they pretend it was something punishable, but if you've turned into your support, then you're actually the one behind the water wheel and you're actually just about to grab them or do something far more sinister. <laughs> and the last thing, this kind of a little like sneaky tactic, is that you can use your sidekick as a way to wake up faster if you're in a hard knockdown. So see this hard knockdown I'm stuck in, usually takes me a long time to get up and I get up, you know, after a few seconds, but if I'm in a hard knockdown, I can wake up a lot quicker and be suddenly straight up when Nezuko just falls from the sky because I don't have the getting up animation. So it can actually make your hard knockdown a little bit more unseeable because all of a sudden the opponent's just getting hit by the opponent as soon as you're able to be woken up. Which can be really handy because a lot of the time, or especially I, I know I do this, but I just stand over my opponent's lying body because I stand there building my meter like this. But if Inosuke switched out with Zenitsu while I was doing that and I didn't react to it, I would have just gotten hit by Zenitsu as he woke up, or he could have just woken up and done a grab instantly, and it could have caught me off guard. So that's a little sneaky instant wake up thing you can do with your supports. Okay, and now I think we should start talking about defensive options in this game. We've talked about all sorts of offense, like your regular attacks into your grabs and everything. But defense is equally as important, as important, because you're not always going to be on offense. So. I think the first place to start when we're talking about defense is the guard push, or the pushback, or whatever you want to call it. It's very, very useful, and it's pretty unique to this game. It's basically just a free pushback you can do when your opponent, when you're just blocking, and it just pushes the opponent away from you. Whatever they're doing, whether they're standing, whether they're attacking or blocking, it'll just push them away. The only time it won't is if they are doing a grab, but that's a very <laughs> specific scenario where you shouldn't be blocking anyways. So. Pushback. It is the keystone of defense because it is what cuts the string of offense. It's what says no to offense, it breaks a little hole in the offense, and it gives you a little bit of an opportunity to go for your defensive measures. Whether you have, whether you go for offensive defensive measures like an armor attack or a DP where you're attacking the opponent on defense, or whether you just jump away. So, Let's talk more in depth about what the push guard actually does. So in this game, a true block string is just a consistent string of attacks where you don't have any room and you're made to block throughout the whole thing. An example of such would be, is if I'm blocking and Inosuke is doing his whole attack string, I'm just stuck here blocking. And what I mean by I'm stuck here blocking is, I'll get Inosuke to attack me, I'm not blocking anymore, I've just released the block button and I'm no longer blocking, and my block, as you just saw then, Tanjiro only just took down his block. So I'll say now when I release my block, release, and the block is still up. So that means that this whole string that Inosuke was just doing, and I could make it even longer by like adding in special moves, and if my guard didn't break it would have gone for a long time, but as you can see there, I don't have to be holding the block button the entire time for my character to be stuck in block stun. And that's what makes it a full block string. It's a string of offense that is uninterruptible. And because you're stuck in this guard animation, obviously you can't be pressing buttons because your character is just stuck like this the whole time, even when I'm not holding the guard button. The way that you beat this though is by using your guard push. And your guard push is kind of what cuts the string of offense. It makes, makes a little tiny break where you push the opponent away and you take your guard down for a moment, well you don't really take your guard down, but you remove the string aspect where you have time to go for buttons, and sometimes you don't really have time to go for buttons, you can still be minus. But basically the thing is, if my opponent is attacking me, I don't have anything I can do, I can't be mashing buttons to like beat them, I can't be mashing DP, nothing's gonna happen if my opponent is just mashing buttons, because they're just gonna be freefully be able to press buttons because you're stuck in block stun the whole time, so a lot of the time you need to use your pushback to break that 
and go for your defensive options because you just don't have the ability to go for them in a regular true block stream. So with Inosuke attacking me, I can push him back as much as I like and as many points. It doesn't cost me anything, it's not unsafe for me to do, I can push him back as much as I like. And it, it's kind of really free for me to do. The only part that becomes risky is what action you choose to take after pushing the opponent back. Because it's very safe to push the opponent back, you still get to block, you're not punishable or anything for doing it. So you need to make sure that you, when, what you do after it doesn't make you die. <laughs> so obviously there are a few obvious options of what to do afterwards. If Inosuke is attacking me, I can just mash and then go for a DP. So obviously one of the best options you have after you push the opponent back is going for an invincible special move like Tanjiro's Whirlpool, or an invincible DP as I like to call it. And you can skip to that part if you'd like to see why. <laughs> but doing an invincible special move is obviously a good option here. As you can see, because even though Inosuke keeps attacking me, I'm invincible, so I beat his further attacks. So this is particularly useful to do at the end of an attack sequence, or at the beginning of an attack sequence. So early on while Inosuke is attacking me, I do a pushback, and just do a pushback into a whirlpool, because Inosuke is probably, you know, I'm, I'm making the prediction that he's just going to keep mashing buttons, and if he does, he'll get hit by my invincible special move. And the same really applies going for an armored attack, you'll just get a little bit more reward for it. So when you do a pushback into an invincible or an armored attack, you're making the prediction that the opponent is going to keep attacking recklessly and you'll be able to armor or invuln through whatever they are doing. And it's a very valid choice on offense, because a lot of the time when you're playing online, people do just mash buttons and you can just armor through them mashing their buttons and it's a very powerful option. But you have to keep in mind that because you're doing an armor attack or because you're doing an invincible DP, you're, you're very punishable if the opponent knows that that's coming. So if Inosuke is attacking me and I go to go for a pushback into a DP, Inosuke has the option of just doing a few attacks and when he sees I push back, he can just jump or sidestep out of the way or just cancel in any other way to avoid my DP or my armored attack. So as you saw there, if Tanjiro went to go for a pushback into an armor attack there, he would have gotten beaten because Inosuke saw that he did a pushback and did a sidestep out of the way. So if you did your armor attack there, Inosuke would have been out of the way and he would have been able to punish Tanjiro's armor attack. So that's how you, you, the opponent could have been able to counter that. Another good option you have, especially if you're a character with a long range grab like Nezuko, is just doing a pushback into a grab. And this kind of works even though it really sort of shouldn't and it mainly just works because it kind of covers two scenarios in a in a fairly good way so if the opponent does just keep mashing buttons there's a good chance that they'll be pushed so far away that one of their attacks will miss but because your grab reaches further it will beat them and it's also just really easy to do because you can be holding the grab button you can be holding the guard button and just mashing the attack button and then you go for a grab automatically and most grabs reach at exactly the range that the opponent gets pushed back so where the opponent's attacks would miss, your grabs do hit. And it can also catch the opponent if they are trying to be a bit more safe. So if the opponent does do a few attacks and then just stop, and they try and block or something, or they just stop there, well they do get hit by this anyways because it's a grab. So the opponent has to actively jump out of the way, or actively do things that reach far enough that they will be able to counter your grab. And the final option, or most defensive option, is just doing a pushback into a jump away, or a pushback into a sidestep out of the way. You're creating the most distance and you're really, really being defensive. You're saying, hey, just get off me. I don't want to attack you back just because you're attacking me. I just want to get out of here. I don't want you having me guard against you. And it's very effective and it's the most safe way to deal with anything because any of the invincible special moves or armors or grabs, anything you do there is committal and it's on a read and it kind of puts you into a rock paper scissors situation about who decides they're doing what. 
But basically if you do a pushback into a sidestep backwards or a pushback into a jump away, there's no real way, there's no real guaranteed way to stop it, especially if you do push back, jump back, sidestep back. Like there's no real way that they're gonna pu punish that, so it's the the kind of the most quintessential defense option. It's really hard to beat, but you don't get anything for it, you just are super defensive and just get away. And uh, so yeah, if you are really scared about the opponent attacking you, like maybe you're fighting a Nezuko that just keeps doing so many attacks into grabs and attacks into grabs, that you just want to get away, you can do that and it's a very good option and it's safe. It doesn't cost you any meter, it doesn't cost you anything and you just get out of the situation. Um, also if you have the obvious read on the opponent is going to be like pressing buttons and they're just going to definitely whiff some buttons if you push them away, like maybe some of Inosuke's attacks won't hit here when he's attacking me, you do obviously just have the attack of the option of just attacking yourself and you can actually do your longer range attack where, you know, here my usually attacks won't work. But as we've mentioned in the attack video section of this video, if you do the extended version of your attack, you'll actually be able to hit around this distance. So at pushback distance, your attacks usually don't work, but if you do the lunge version, you can hit cleanly. So maybe if the opponent isn't doing their lunge version, you'll be able to beat them by just by doing a regular attack, which is the easiest way of winning this encounter. Now, obviously any defensive mechanic comes with a way to circumvent it or a way to beat it. And the way you beat pushbacks is just by going back in. If you know your opponent is going to push back and try and do something, maybe they push back and press buttons, push back and grab, push back and even jump away, or push back and try and do anything, you have the option of chasing them down. So if I have Inosuke try and push me back, and I'm attacking him, And I know when he's going to push back, I can go for my water wheel, which is a really good option against pushbacks because it moves forward. So any time when I think the opponent is going to push back, or if I ever see the opponent has pushed me back, I can just be like, uh-uh, water wheel, I'm getting straight back in there on top of you. And then they have to push back you again. And there's a cooldown on how much you can spam the pushback. So right after they push back, they can't push back right immediately after you do the water wheel. So you're back right on top of them. And yeah, so mainly special moves are going to be the way you're dealing with this, but you do also obviously have the option of just... You can dash in if you'd like, but that does cost you meter just for dashing in, which is kind of eh. I, I don't really see the point in it, but yeah, whenever you're like doing it and it's pretty telltale when the opponent is going to push you back, because a lot of time it is, like, it's so obvious, just do a special move that you know will hit at that distance, and then if they try and do literally anything, especially if I've done my water wheel here, if Inosuke tries to grab me, if Inosuke tries to attack me, if he tries to throw a special move or even jump backwards, he's gonna get hit by my water wheel if he tries to do anything after his pushback. So it really becomes a bit of a gamble for him trying to use his pushback, because if he does it at, if he tries to do anything after the pushback at the wrong time, I'll chase him down with my water wheel, hit him, and you know, if I go into my waterfall, well then we all know how much huge damage I'm gonna get from that. So. That's basically the essence of the pushback. The pushback itself is the safest thing in the world. There's no threat to actually doing it, but you just got to make sure you're chasing down the opponent thinking that they can do whatever the hell they want after it. So if the opponent thinks they can just push back and attack you all day, you can beat that just by doing special moves. If they think they can push back and do armored attacks all day, well you have to be a little bit more careful there. That's what that's the hardest thing to beat. If you're attacking the opponent and they keep doing pushbacks, they push you back and then go for a DP. You gotta make sure you're watching for them and they push back and then just do a few attacks and then duck away. Go hide out of the way and then they'll do their DP and they'll look stupid and funny and then you get to get a full punish on them. So just make sure you're really beating them up and making them realize that they make a mistake every time they do that. Using a pushback is also really important in situations like where you would be stuck on your support. So in situations like this where like Nezuko would be on top of me and Tanjiro can dash in, go for a grab, whatever. Um, that's usually a really bad scenario and if you do accidentally get caught with an opponent's like sidekick on top of you, you can just push them back and it pushes them away and then you can jump out of the way and you're not really stuck there for long. So really make sure you can just use and abuse pushback like as much as you want because it, it's free and it just gets you out of offense and it makes your opponent really think how they can make their offense more real and it just makes them harder for them. So make sure you're using pushback, but make sure you're careful about what you do after pushback and make sure you're actually thinking about it and not just mindlessly going, oh, pushback DP, or pushback jump away, pushback jump away, because then you're no better than your opponent.
The next defensive mechanic is definitely a lot more situational and you're going to use it a lot less than you would your pushback. Because pushback, you can just mash that all day, it's totally free, you just have to think about what you do afterwards. Um, a more... maybe advanced defensive mechanic is the parry. Because the parry is something where you have to really make a read on what the opponent's going to do and you have to really commit to an option saying the opponent will hit me here and I will parry them and then I get a lot of reward for it. And the parry, if you do it at the wrong time, you're very punishable for it. The opponent could grab you or if they don't attack you, then there's just a lot of recovery frames where they, the opponent can just like punish you for it and get a full damage combo just because you thought you'd be really cool and get a parry. But where the parry does become really useful is particularly in situations like with a dash in or with special move dash ins, maybe they, they can't be cancelled as easily. But a lot of the time, especially in lower level online scenarios, people just dash in like all the way just as easy ways to get in. And this is a perfect situation to go for a parry. So if the opponent is ever just dashing in, you can go for a parry and it's the perfect time to go for a parry because it's really obvious when the opponent is going to hit you. You can see like, oh they're dashing, I just parry and then boom, I know they're about to hit me. So I get to go in for this lovely big combo because if you didn't know, when you parry, you get a lovely long blue combo which is a longer combo than you usually get and you can get some really extra cool stuff like this. Which is a lot of damage for honestly not too much resource, it's just a really awesome situation. So in situations like that, where the opponent's dashing in, or when Inosuke does his boar rush, or when Shinobu does her butterfly sidestep dance thingy where she charges at you, there are a lot of situations where you know your opponent is going to hit you, but you haven't been locked into any situation. You can technically do a parry after the opponent is doing a full attack string, Like that. There are circumstances where if you push back at the right time, you can get a full cool combo and a full parry on them that just is like embarrasses them. But um, that's a little bit more situational and you have to really, really know the matchup and know your opponent's buttons really well in order to do that. So off of dash-ins and force dash-ins like Inosuke's charge, Shinobu's charge, are a lot better situations to get a parry. But um... Also just in situations where you know your opponent is going to hit you with something, like after I've maybe done something that's slightly minus but not minus enough for them to actually hit me, so after like a water wheel, you do have the option sometimes of going for a parry there. Sometimes though that isn't guaranteed, especially you know characters with faster attacks can actually beat you there. and. Certain situations make it finicky, but just there are situations where you're like, hmm, I know my opponent is going to attack me right now. I could go for an armored attack just to armor through whatever, or I could go for a parry, which is a lot cooler, a lot flashier, and lets me go for some cool fancy combos I saw on Twitter. So yeah, it's basically just if you really know that something's going to happen, you can go for a parry, but otherwise I recommend you go for an armored attack, because armored attack and invincible attacks are just... A lot less high commitment and a lot less possible reward because like if the opponent is just standing there you do a parry nothing happens if the opponent's standing there they do get hit by this it's just w invincible and armored attacks win a lot more situations than a parry does but the parry's cool and um i'm not sure if i specifically mentioned them yet but i mentioned them talking about you know p after pushbacks and stuff but obviously defensive things include your invincible attacks like your dp your guard special move and your armored attack because obviously they're armored so anytime you think the opponent is definitely going to hit you you pop these and then boom you armor through them and you hit them back it's pretty simple it's like the basics of gaming if you have an invincible special move you press it when the opponent you think the opponent is going to press something and you end up beating them the same applies for your ultimates if someone's maybe throwing projectiles or doing a really long sequence or a dash in or something yeah you can just pop it you can throw an ultimate you can throw a whirlpool you can throw something and you'll just win.
And I just want to quickly mention parries, even though they're kind of character specific. There are only two real parries I can think about in this game, because they act a little bit differently to armored special moves. Whereas a lot of characters have invincible or armored special moves, like Tanjiro and Inosuke, and Nezuko and, Tan and Zenitsu. For over half the cast has invincible special moves. But having a parry is pretty unique. And Gyus, for example, he goes into a parry state where he can parry all attacks except for grabs. And if he does so successfully and the opponent gets hit by his follow-up, then they get sucked into a blue combo and takes a lot of damage. Whereas someone like Yushiro has an interesting parry that is actually an attack. And it just is an attack that's in a parry state where if anyone hits him with, a, with an attack, even a grab, he will go into a parry state where he just becomes invincible for that attack that hits him. And he just does a different follow-up attack. So they're kind of just two different ways of achieving the same thing. Except Yushiro's is just kind of better that he can become invincible through anything, even a projectile or a grab. And it's more mobile because it moves him forwards while he does it, while Giyu just stands there. But you just have to be careful with Yushiro's because he does this follow-up attack that could be parried possibly by Giyu. But it's still pretty powerful. And the last defensive mechanic, I think, is the sidestep. And the sidestep is a defensive mechanic because it's briefly invincible, I'm pretty sure. And it, what it really works well at is destroying tracking on moves. So moves that like track your location and can like follow you down, like Inosuke's dash, it can curve around and follow me. And even if I'm doing something that moves me sideways a lot, it will still follow me. The only thing that will destroy its tracking is my sidestep. It makes him just go in a straight line very awkwardly and he will just not hit me. And that's basically what sidesteps are good for. You can use them to get out of the way of the opponent's attacks, because if he's doing these things, like my sidestep just completely annihilates, like there's no chance he's going to be able to hit me if I'm holding sidestep. And it just makes it for a very easy way of avoiding things, as long as you're sidestepping in the right direction, not in their face. But uh, yeah, sidesteps are powerful, especially jump sidesteps. You cover so much distance, and you're still in the air, so you can still take an air action, which I think is so ridiculous. But, um, yes, you can. So you can kind of dodge the opponent in order to get in on them and go in on them and attack them. If you do, like, a jump forward sidestep, it's it's pretty cool stuff. But sidesteps, I honestly don't think there's too much to talk about with them. Obviously, they're powerful. They ruin tracking. They're a good way of getting around dash-ins and stuff. And, yeah, you, they're just your fundamental defensive tool that is just used for movement. You jump sidestep, get out of the way of the things, you dodge their attacks, and if you can hit them back after dodging their attacks, you may as well. A quick little something to mention about guarding is the concept of the guard break, which in this game is pretty simple. There's no meter or anything to show it on the screen, but you just get to visually, qualitatively see it on the screen from the character guarding. So you can see his shield, goes from blue to yellow to orange and eventually it will break and then after it breaks you get to get a full combo. I think after I do some stuff like this, this is god guaranteed. Yeah, like those four special moves of Tanjiro automatically break the guard. Different attacks have different amount of guard health depletion so they do different amount of damage to the guard. Projectiles generally do very very little to the guard meter, there's 100 in total, but things like your dash in do 25, so four dash ins, each of them does a huge chunk and they'll completely deplete your guard meter in just a few of them, so that's very powerful to use them in pressure, so after you've done like a few attacks and do that, it instantly makes it yellow and then it very quickly becomes red and breaks, especially if you're playing against a character like Water Tanjiro with really big hitting things. So, different special moves and stuff all are different just depending on each other, like Tanjiro's are all pretty big hitting, uh, but that's not the case for every character. Um, obviously, a held armor attack will also automatically break your guard, so keep an eye out for that, don't just stand there against a held armor attack. But uh, yeah, it's just a little, little mechanic that stops people from standing there guarding all day. But it shouldn't happen too often, especially if you're being active with your defensive tools and pushing the opponent away, and being active on defense. And after a little while of not blocking, it will like regenerate back to blue even after it's been red. So it just takes a little bit of time, comes back, just stops you from blocking literally all day. 
So as for knockdowns in this game, there are basically just two options. There are hard knockdowns and there are not hard knockdowns. And or I guess I should call them soft knockdowns because they're potential hard knockdowns. But basically, a hard knockdown is your down combo. The opponent is splattered onto the ground and they are forced to stay there. They can't recover anything. Um, your aerial attack string is a hard knockdown as well. And what I mean by hard knockdown is if the opponent knows how to do a recovery. So if they press the attack button, I mean, if they press the jump button at all when they like launched into the air, and it's not a hard knockdown, they can do this quick bounce up where they basically don't get knocked down at all and it removes the advantage you have to chase them up. So like, see, he does a recovery here and I have like no advantage afterwards. Um, if I do... What else is in a hard knockdown? Um, um, waterfall on a non-grounded opponent is not a hard knockdown. As you can see, he can just bounce up. That's a not hard knockdown, but if your opponent doesn't press the jump button, then these do actually magically become hard knockdowns, even though they shouldn't be. So even though this technically shouldn't have knocked the opponent down, they get knocked down just because he hasn't done a hard, the auto recovery from pressing the jump button, and this also becomes a hard knockdown just because the opponent messed up. So make sure you're not the opponent that messes up. So things that are hard knockdowns are really good because they give you a lot of time where you can just stand there and build your meter, whereas things that aren't a hard knockdown and the opponent can recover quickly, you don't get enough time to do anything basically after your combo and it's straight back into the action. Which means you don't get enough meter back afterwards and you're probably going to be at a bit of a disadvantage compared to your opponent. After being knocked down, even in a hard knockdown, you have the option of rolling in different directions to wake up. So as you can see there, I was controlling Inosuke, and Inosuke was able to roll really far away, that's like 6 character lengths away from Tanjiro, which is pretty ridiculous. So a hard knockdown is by no means a guaranteed way of having the opponent in front of you when they wake up, because they can roll in any direction, it creates a lot of distance, which is a really good way of avoiding like unlockable mix-ups. So make sure you're using a roll when you wake up and you're not just being an idiot that wakes up right into your opponent's offense and just is like, okay. Just gonna wake up right here and start pressing buttons because you've just woken up right in their face. At least like roll behind them or do something cool. Or the best option is to do a recovery and don't give them any advantage at all. But if they are forcing a hard knockdown, I recommend rolling into them or like rolling out like beside them so that you end out out here and you're awkwardly like beside what they would have done. And one big thing I really wanted to talk about in this full breakdown video is the structure of combos. Combos, the thing that everyone loves about fighting games. It's the only reason you ever want to play is that lucky moment when you finally get the hit and you get to do the combo that you practice in training mode for five minutes before you inevitably drop it. But combo structure in this game is, I was going to say kind of unique, but Maybe that's giving it a bit too much credit. It's going to be similar to most games. You're going to do a bunch of normal attacks, which in this game is very easy because you just mash the attack button. So you mash the attack button, you go into the special moves. You might mash the attack button again, go into another special move. Maybe you'll use another special move to finish. Tanjiro can use a grab to finish. Maybe you'll take a hard knockdown to finish. And that's going to be about it. Your combos... I mean, obviously, they're just going to be a linkage of regular moves into special moves and whatever ends up doing a bunch of damage to that character or whatever works is going to be your good damaging combos. But as a rule of thumb in this game, your special moves are always going to be where the... <laughs> what's they say? The meat and potatoes of where the damage comes from. It's You're going to be getting your chunks of damage from special moves. And if you've only played this game, you might think like, oh, that's kind of obvious. Obviously, I'm going to get my damage from special moves. But that's not the case in all games. A lot of games, special moves are just a way to link together a bunch of your normals in order to get, you know, they're the glue. But in this game, your regular normals are the glue that link together the big damaging special moves in this game. And the reason I say so is your normal attacks really don't do much damage, and they also scale the damage of your combo quite a bit. And I guess I'll quickly talk about scaling now. Scaling just means if there's something with a lot of scaling, it just means every hit that comes after that high scaling hit will do less damage. So something that can cause a lot of scaling in this game is using the same special moves over and over again. So say here, if I do three waterfalls in a row and then do a grab, and let me turn on damage information, you can see that that- oh, nope, that glitched out. So if I do three waterfalls here, then go for a grab, 
you can see that the last hit of the grab did 165 damage. It was really, really low because I'd done three waterfalls in a row. But if I had have done waterfall into water wheel into waterfall, it won't be much better, but it will certainly be better. Yeah, almost double there, 275. So as you can see there, certain things in this game cause more scaling of your combo and it causes the attacks that come after it to do less damage. So in this game, the main thing that causes that is doing the same special move over and over again. So you want to make sure in a combo, in order to make sure you're doing the most damage, is you use all three of your special moves, or you at least use a variety. So you could do something like this. A bunch of attacks into water wheel, into waterfall, and then if you... And then, okay, and then that missed for some reason, but if we keep it super simple. Water wheel, waterfall, and a bunch more attacks into your whirlpool. That did a lot of damage for a super simple combo, it didn't take any execution at all. It was really, really easy, but it did a big chunk of damage because I always used all three of my special moves, so they didn't scale each other. Now unfortunately, in this game, normal attacks actually have quite a bit of scaling compared to special moves. So the more normal attacks you use in a combo, the less damage it will do if you used it, replaced with other things, but obviously, Normal attacks are kind of the only free way you have of attacking, so you can't spend the whole combo like this most of the time, because you need the meter to do so. But, um, yeah. Sometimes in combos, if you're trying to go for optimal stuff, you want to do your big damage that doesn't have the scaling normals at the start. So if I wanted to do more damage with my combo, I could start it with less attacks, and do stuff like this, and I would end up getting more damage than I would have if I had started it in a different way. So even just doing a simple combo like this, that let me get over 50% of my opponent's life just from doing some attacks, just because I did less normal attacks at the start. Obviously, yes, you're going to have to do normal attacks at some point, and they do add some damage. It's not like adding them will make them do less damage, but just where they go in a combo, they're going to scale the damage that comes after them. So just think about that, but honestly, uh, most of the time it doesn't really matter. It only really matters if you're really going for super high optimal damage and like you just need that extra tiny little bit of damage. But most of the time you know, it's fine to do a bunch of attacks in a combo, it's not going to cost too much. What's worse is doing the same special moves over and over again. So uh, yeah, we've talked about scaling, we've talked about how most of the damage in your combos are going to come from special moves, let's talk about what the structure of like combos will actually be. So most of the time when you get a combo, it's going to be off of a normal attack. Maybe you've punished something the opponent did, or you've just gone in and attacked and it just happened to hit the opponent because they weren't guarding or they got mixed up or something. So yeah, you go in for some attacks and generally, unless you have specific combos that you've practiced, you want to try and hit confirm your attacks as soon as you can. So like, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm actually hitting the opponent here, they're not blocking me. Now I can go into my combo. Because you want to go into your special moves as soon as you can in order to get the most damage um, so that you have the least scaling from doing too many normal attacks. Obviously for some characters like Tanjiro who are kind of like the main characters of the game, it's pretty easy for him to do a full attack string into special moves because it's kind of like the game was built around him and he can just do whatever he likes and he gets the perfect amount of damage. For a lot of, but for a lot of characters this isn't the case. Like Shinobu for example, if she does too many normal attacks in her attack string she gets like zero damage. She can get like less than a thousand if she uses too many attacks. So you gotta be careful about it with some people. So in a combo, you just want to think about what connects into what and when you want to cancel things into each other. So for Tanjiro, he has a water wheel, a waterfall, and a whirlpool. You can't combo for the whirlpool, so it'll only ever be used as an ender. And I know that I like to end my combos in waterfall because it gives me a lot of time to build meter back. So a combo that I do with Tanjiro is just going to be a bunch of hits, maybe into a waterfall, into a bunch of hits, into a waterfall. But I see I have a little bit more time than that, and I'm happy to spend a little bit more meter in this combo, so I decide, actually, you know what, I'll spend a water wheel in there, because water wheel can be cancelled into any special move, so it's just a good extender, so I can just pop it in there for a bit extra damage. That's kind of the only real role, role of water wheel in a combo. And if I get a combo off of a water wheel, well, it kind of just acts like that, it's a combo sign, you can just link it into other special moves and then it does its job. Um, if you're looking for some more unique combos, sometimes you can do combos that with dash cancels or jump cancels in order to get some more unique damage. 
Nezuko is actually a character that does a lot of damage with her base attacks. So a high damaging combo with her will actually look something like this, where it almost com completely consists of regular attacks. So if you attack into some jumping attacks, and then a full attack string into the one special move to finish, does a ton of damage with Nezuko, and that's an exception, and she's definitely an exceptional character. She has a lot of exceptions that makes her different to other people. But yeah, that's just thinking about different ways of doing combos. It's either going to be connecting together a bunch of special moves to just think about how much you want to spend versus how much damage you're going to get for it. And that's kind of how it is with Tanjiro. I'm like, oh, how much damage... How much meter am I willing to spend here? Do I want to spend all five? Yeah, okay, I'll do a bunch of attacks and do some special moves. I'll just use all five meter and then get about 50% damage. I can do that if I'd like, or if I'm feeling a little stingy, I might just do one bar combo and just do like something like a full attack string into a waterfall, and then an armored attack, which is free. And like, do that. That combo costs me a single bar, and if I'm feeling a bit stingy, I can do that sometimes. And you just really think about how much meter you want to spend on the combos and just know what links into what. And then you can really make combos on the fly in this game. It's really amazing. You don't really need to know optimal combo paths or what links into what because most things are pretty flexible. Like if I grab the controller for Inosuke right now, I can just be like, oh, okay, let me just do a few attacks into this. And I can do a few attacks. And I don't feel like spending too much meter, so I'll just end in Boar Rush to end the combo like that. Or I know that if I do this, I can get a blue combo and get something kind of cool going like this. So what if I do a few attacks and then spend a little bit more meter like this, and then maybe I'll just end the combo here to get a hard knockdown, and then I take this meter from the hard knockdown. Like, none of that stuff is anything I watched in a combo video, I didn't have to look any of that up, but most of it is extremely useful stuff to use in an online environment, because it's just you thinking about what you want while you're doing a combo, and then getting it very easy to have super flexible combos in this game because it's, it's just really easy to link things together. Everything links into everything and it's only exception characters like Nezuko who have these funky combos that do a lot of damage um, from a lot of normals. Another funky character is actually on this team right now is Zenitsu. Zenitsu has weird combos where he tries to get as many of these this prime special move as he can in a combo because it does a lot of damage. And you can get some weird ways of going into it, like using a free dash in and then doing this. And then because the opponent's left close enough, he can kind of do it again and then get the dash in again and kind of do stuff. I messed it up there because I haven't played with Zenitsu in ages and that controller has different orientations. But he's got kind of unique combos and that is kind of unique stuff you can figure out with the character. But if I didn't know that about Zenitsu and I only knew that he had like these things, well I could just do, you know, a few attacks into this and then do something like that. And that combo is completely useful, completely viable, had a short hard knockdown. It does the job. You don't need to know all these fancy combos. But having any kind of simple combo is the easiest thing in the game to figure out, which is what makes this game so easy to pick up. You can play any character as long as you know what their special moves are. You can basically play them. Like if I know they have a water wheel, I'm like gonna be like, oh yeah, I can do a water wheel into some other special move, and then some attacks and a water wheel and some other special move, and end it with some other special move, and I'll probably get a big chunk of damage. And with Tanjiro, that's clearly the case. Now there are kind of two other things to take note of when you're doing a combo, um, other than okay. There are a few things to think about. Let's think about them all together. So when you're doing a combo, you want to think about how much meter do I want to spend in this combo? How much damage? How much meter am I willing to spend to get the damage I would get for spending all that meter? Do I really feel like cashing, cashing out all of my meter, spending all five bars to get like half of my opponent's life? Or do I want to be a little bit more lenient, only spend one bar and get about a quarter of their life, or like around about that, just so I get less guaranteed damage? Or do I want to go all out? So that's like the first layer. Then I also have to think about how much meter do I have, and I do, do I want to build meter at the end of the combo? Because that'll affect how I end my combo, because if I am really low on meter, I'm like, yeah, I really want to build some meter, because I like having a lot of meter against this character, because he really stuffs up when I do waterfall on block. Well, I'll do my waterfall to end the combo, because I get to build a lot of meter. Then I've thought about that I really want meter in this matchup, and I want to always have meter, so I'll end my combos in ways that do less damage, but let me build it back more meter. And if I'm playing Nezuko, that could look make my combos look particularly different, because I might end up doing stuff like this. 
uh, I don't know exactly what to do, but then you do this for the hard knockdown and you build back a bunch of meter. Because maybe you never see goes like, nah, I'm low on meter, I really need to make sure I build it back every time I end my combo. So I'm going to end my combos like this all the time now in this matchup. Because I really feel like I always need the meter to go for crazy scratching and I just can't waste it in combos. That's another thing to think about. So you need to think about damage to meter ratio. Like, how much am I willing to cash out right now? You also think about how do I want to end this combo if I want to just get some meter back at the end of the combo? Do I want to, yeah, do I want to do something special to build meter back at the end of the combo? And you also need to think about the opponent breaking out of the combo if they have the gauge to do so. So if I'm doing a full combo with my opponent and I have the feeling that they're going to break out of the combo, I'm not going to want to do all of my... I'm not going to... Or I guess it depends. If I know the opponent's going to break out of the combo, maybe I'll want to just spend all of the high damaging stuff, like my special moves, right at the beginning, or do one really early before they break out of the combo, so I get this big chunk of damage before he breaks out. And even though I only got a little bit there, I got the full damage of the waterfall. Whereas usually, if I get like a big hit from the punish, and then he just does that, I didn't really get anything, and I have to chase him down and spend a bar of meter on that. But if you do get a really nice juicy hit and you have a lot of bar, Maybe you don't want to spend all of your bar like when you think the opponent's going to break out of the combo because then I've accidentally just wasted a bunch of meter when he was about to break away. So sometimes it's really worthwhile just doing a full long attack string on the opponent and then you see that, that yeah, they broke away and I didn't spend anything. So I just get to save all my meter, I see they break away, and then I can chase them down. And now that they don't have any supports, now that I've chased them down and hit them again, <laughs> I get to do a big chunk of damage that I would want. And you also just have to think about when the opponent breaks the combo, because sometimes that can really impact you and your life. Because um, uh, with none of these characters we have here, it doesn't matter too much. But sometimes if the opponent breaks out of the combo when you're about to do something, it can actually be a little bit punishable. So if I'm doing a few hits, and I've just done my water wheel, and then Inosuke dashes in and tries to punish me, that could have been really bad. So let's try that again. And then depending on when my waterfall came out, sometimes you can punish Tanjiro for going for the waterfall. And then Nosuke dashes in and gets a punish for it. So you need to be thinking about, uh, if my opponent's mashing the side step, like the sidekick change button, I probably shouldn't go for the waterfall here and I'll just wait for him to press it and then just do my free attacks. Also, you can see when the opponent is pressing the support gauge. So like, as I'm hitting Inosuke right now, I can see that he's mashing the support button, and a lot of the time I like watching that, seeing the opponent is just mashing it. So I just get to see, like, oh, well when I get a hit, you're just gonna go straight out? Cool, I'll just do this. Or, if I think they're mashing it, they're not, they're not doing anything, they're just mashing their support button. So when they do get their support, I'm just gonna stop, and then they're just gonna summon their support like an idiot, like in my face, and I can armor through them, and they've just wasted a bunch of meter. So yeah, just watch what your opponent does when you're doing your combos, and just think about think about the things we said to think about, remember? How much meter are you willing to spend on this combo? Do you need to spend meter after the combo? And if so, how do you get your hard knockdown for that? And do you think the opponent is mashing on breakaway button? And also, how do you want to end up after the combo? If you're a zoning character, you might want to end the combo in something that blasts you really far away, like something like this, so that you've some distance in between you and the opponent, you can start throwing projectiles. Obviously, I, I am not that, but that's something to think about. And in the breath of combos kind of comes a few terms like mix-ups, pressure, frame traps, and setups. So, all of these things, very cool, love them all. Um, some are more simple than the other. For example, mix-ups. Um, the only real mix-up in this game is like strike or throw whether the opponent gets hit by a throw, an unblockable, or another regular strike. So in situations like this, where the opponent thinks that I'm just going to go for more attacks, they were wrong, and they get hit by my throw as a consequence. Whereas there was also the option that they just get hit by a strike. This run-in is just a strike, it's a regular hit. Or I can fake it out and make it seem like I'm going to go for a throw, but then go for more attacks. And that's the essence of strike throws. It's kind of a mix-up where the opponent's like, oh, do I need to jump away? Do I stand here blocking? Like, am I going to get hit if I try to move away or mash buttons? Or if I stand here blocking, am I going to get hit by a throw? That's the essence of mix-ups. Pressure is just doing anything to keep the opponent on 
like blocking, basically, making the opponent feel scared, and everything that I'm doing now is applying pressure to my blocking opponent. And like if they're trying to push me away, going in for water wheels to make myself go in on top of them, that is applying pressure because I'm chasing them down while they're blocking. They're trying to get away, they're trying to push me away, but I keep doing water wheel, and they can't get away because I'm applying pressure to them. Frame traps are actually a really interesting one, and I don't think people know about them. Frame traps is really important to the guard, the concept of guarding in this game and how guarding works. So as I've talked about before, if I'm guarding and I have, oops, you don't scare attack me. So Tundra is guarding. Tundra is not guarding anymore. He's not holding the guard button any longer. But he was still guarding the rest of that thing because that was full. A full smooth attack string, it was a full block string that Tanjiro didn't have an opportunity to stop guarding in because it was a full string of Inosuke's. The only way that Tanjiro can stop guarding here is if he does a push guard and then he can do whatever he wants after his push guard. Frame traps are interesting because unlike this string, which is not a frame trap, it's a block string, frame traps have enough gaps in between them that your character can stop blocking. A really Noticeable one and the one that I probably use the most is Akaza. Akaza's frame trap is really useful with his projectiles because the gap between him pressing buttons and the projectiles and even between the projectiles themselves is long enough that if you're not holding guard throughout the entire time, your character will stop holding guard. So unlike in this situation where I'm not holding guard anymore, if we're talking about the Akaza situation, and I was holding guard at the beginning, and he started doing things, and he does his projectiles, if I'm not holding guard, I'm gonna get hit by the projectiles because there's enough of a gap where my character stops guarding. The same thing sort of happens if Inosuke starts to delay his attacks. And where frame traps are really important is because it catches something that people don't realize they're doing. Because they don't realize that if they're blocking here, they, a lot of times people are just mashing on the attack button and they're just mashing at the end of a combo just to see like I'm now mashing with Tanjiro, oops I'm now mashing with Tanjiro, I'm mashing with Tanjiro and then as soon as I can, Tanjiro will actually mash so a lot of people are actually doing that while they're blocking they're just mashing the, the attack button or they're mashing the jump back button to like get out of the way of the combo and like get out of the sequence because they don't want to be there anymore and they just get out of the way. But if you do a frame trap like Akaza's projectiles, it'll catch anything the opponent is trying to do and they'll get hit because they're trying to do something else because their guard actually stops where it usually wouldn't stop until they get the perfect opportunity to jump or attack out of an attack string. So if the opponent is just standing there blocking, or if the opponent is blocking and they're standing there mashing the attack button and then Akaza does a projectile, there's going to be a slight gap where the opponent can start pressing their attack button, but it's not big enough for them to actually attack. So they just get hit by Akaza's projectile, and then Akaza gets to go into for a full combo. The same applies if the opponent's trying to jump out of the way. There's not enough room for them to actually jump, so they just let go of guard like an idiot and get hit by the projectile. So it's very important, and some characters have that, particularly with slightly slower things. So, if... as you saw there. Inosuke kind of delayed the last hit of his attack string, and that's where delays in attack strings becomes really useful. Because if you delay your attack a little bit, there's so much of a gap that the opponent stops blocking if they're not holding down the block button, and they actually get to take an action. And usually that sounds like a bad thing, but there's not enough time for them to actually take an action. There's just enough time to show that they're not standing there guarding and being respectful of what you're doing. So yeah, that's frame traps. And they're very specific and you need to learn about them and if your character has any. But everyone can basically do them just by delaying your attack string and doing all of your attacks really slowly. And slow special moves, um, I don't think the waterfall does, but some projectiles and some characters have things that work really, really well as frame traps. And they're very cool. I wish I could talk about them longer, but I think we're losing viewers by the minute as the longer I talk about this. And the last one that I mentioned is setups, and I don't think any of these characters I have on the screen have setups, <laughs> once again. As it says in the names, they're things you set up, so it's things like Rokodaki's Trap, Enmu's Explosive Bubble, um, there's not too many setup characters in the game. Those are kind of the only two I can actually really think of, right? 
Yeah, they're things you put on the screen that have that activate later on or they help you later on. I guess Lady Tamayo is kind of a setup tool because she can use be used for Oki and stuff. But yeah, putting a setup on the screen and then using it really well. Like like Enmu when he does a bunch of attacks into the orb and a bunch of attacks into the reset of the orb and the opponent's just standing in front of you, you set up this orb in front of them, like just sitting on top of them, and then while he goes for that armor attack, like none of this is real, this isn't a normal situation, it's only a good situation because there's that orb there. And then the setup is that if they keep standing there, they get hit by the armor attack, their guard breaks, then they get hit by the orb, then Enmu can follow up with follow-up attacks. And that whole situation is a setup. You set up that weird scenario where the opponent's like, what the hell's going on? I'm just gonna stand here blocking. And then they get caught for it. That's a setup and it's really, really bloody awesome. Cause usually like in situations where I do a few attacks like with Tanjiro here and then go for a held armor attack, like there's no way my opponent is gonna respect that. But it's because with Enmu, I've particularly designed that situation. I've engineered it for them to fall for it. And then they do, and then it's brilliant. And then there are other situations where if you um, set them up and you think that they're going to jump away, then you do a setup where you do aerial projectiles that will catch them jumping, and then you've set them up to be in a situation where they get caught. It's pretty cool stuff. I love it. Okay, now let's talk about a little bit of a, a cool thing that's a bit of an advanced thing to talk about that I feel like even a lot of, you know, more well-versed players online don't really understand fully about is how the meter mechanics actually work for the blue meter at the top of the screen. Like, the ultimate meter at the bottom is pretty simple. Let's talk about that first. It's pretty obvious. It is literally just based off of damage, so anything on guard, like, doesn't build any guard meter at all. It's only physical hits, build your guard, build your ultimate gauge, and the amount that the attacker gets so, so you can see the amount that Tanjiro builds when he hits Inosuke is more than Inosuke builds, and Inosuke builds three quarters of what Tanjiro builds when he's being hit. So the person dying gets three quarters the amount of meter of the person hitting them. So it's pretty simple, and like big hitting things will deal big chunks of damage to the meter. See, so you're just doing a bunch of special moves, it's going to build a ton of meter because I'm just doing a ton of damage. And uh, yeah. That's how that meter works. But let's talk about the blue meter now, because it's kind of interesting. So obviously, you have five bars of blue meter. You need your blue special meter in order to do all of your special moves and to cancel things. So like to cancel your regular attacks into a dash in, or to keep yourself safe and cancel them into a jump or something, or just to do your combos with your special moves and your dash in, blue meter is really important. Or for your mix-ups, it's really important because you need the meter to cancel your dash into a grab and blah, 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 blah. So, how does the blue meter build itself? So let me just quickly get rid of all of my meter here. And we can watch how it builds up. So, as I'm moving, you can see it has a passive regeneration that's reasonably fast. Every about 5 seconds I'll get a bar of meter. The same applies if I'm blocking or dashing in on the opponent or attacking the opponent. It will always be the same. It does freeze when you use a special move. So it freezes while you use a special move and for a few frames after you use a special move. So special moves do not only use your meter, but they also stop it from regenerating. So if you are wanting to build meter again, you've really got to make sure you don't use any special moves because they really stunt the blue meter growth. But what accelerates the blue meter growth is if I just stop moving at all. I'll go into my supercharged state where it builds a lot faster. You can see Tanjiro's doing his Senjutsu and breathing and making it go a lot faster up. And this is where you can actually build strategies around your meter. And for Tanjiro it's pretty easy because I can just do stuff like this and pretend this was a cool long fancy combo. If I end a combo in Waterfall, he gets this automatic hard knockdown where I can just stand still for ages before the opponent wakes up and I have a ton of time where I can just stand there as the opponent's stuck on the floor and build my meter. So instead of ending my combo properly, like with a grab or something to get a tiny bit of extra damage, I can take this time to build back a lot more meter than I usually would be able to. So if I did... Okay, let's do a simple combo. Then I ended in a grab. I've got three bars of meter missing, and the opponent's back on their feet instantly, and now we're attacking each other, we're in the neutral, and I've only got two bars of meter to work with until, you know, a few seconds later, and I've got three. But if I ended that combo differently, 
And instead of doing the grab at the end, I just left it and stood there. I get to build back two and a bit of those bars before Inosuke even wakes up and basically back up to max meter from the full combo that I did, which is pretty crazy. So it makes my combo almost free just because I chose to lose a tiny little bit of damage. So that's why there's a lot of strategy in ending your combos into, hmm, do I want to take this damage? Do I want to take this meter building? And in different situations, the pros and cons can weigh differently. But in this situation with Tanjiro, I think it's far more worth it to build three bars of meter than get the tiny bit of grab damage. And you're left with the opponent right in front of you and you've got all of your meter back. So you can spend tons of meter on more water wheels and more waterfalls, because waterfalls plus on block as we've talked about previously. Um, yeah, having more meter is just always more good. So you want to make sure you're taking this hard knockdown with Tanjiro. Now, like I said, Tanjiro is pretty simple with this whole situation. Some characters have to think about it a little bit more. Um, I wouldn't say Nezuko has to think about it a ton, but she's on my team, so we'll talk about it. Nezuko, her main combo, if you want to do like a cool b, &B is something like this. And then full attack string, into the DP, and that's a lot of damage for three bars. So Nezuko's kind of a situation where I'm like, oh, honestly, maybe it is worth just spending it and going all out and just doing a full combo, because she gets a lot of reward for it. But um, she does also have the option, at the end of that full combo there, she could have just ended it like this. And I have my opponent set to auto quick recover, so this is a forced hard knockdown here. So she can actually have a little bit of time. Let's say I ended, like, just did that full whole combo again. I won't just to save time. But she can actually end the combo. Oops. In the dive kick without the animation, and she gets actually a little bit of a hard knockdown here, where she can build about half a bar or a full bar before the opponent can get to her. And because there's quite a bit of distance in between her and the opponent, she could actually just test the waters and just stand there for a little bit longer and see if the opponent goes straight into chasing her. And she might even have the chance to be able to build back the full two bars before they even get to her. So it gives her an opportunity to build back some meter. But if she is really lacking the meter, maybe she's spent a lot of meter in neutral and stuff, she does have options of building back a bunch of meter. She can change her BNB &B to be something like this. Like, if you're really low on meter, end in this hard knockdown, because as we've spoken about, your aerial attack string is a good hard knockdown. That's a hard knockdown, leaves the opponent on the floor, and she got to build back two bars of meter, or three bars of meter, before the opponent woke up. If you kind of count the other stuff. Um, but let's get rid of some meter again. She also can do... Like this, take this hard knockdown. And then she builds a little bit of meter near the end of the combo, and she's built back a bit of bar so that she's not totally drab by the end. Obviously, hopefully you never want to be in this situation with Nezuko, hopefully you don't want to be like completely out of meter. But um, having the option of ending your combo in a hard knockdown is really important um, for a lot of characters. And something that adds just a little bit more nuance and a bit of detail that you'd probably never even notice in the game is that different moves um, they don't cost different amounts of meter, but they have different amounts of delay until the meter comes back. Because as we mentioned, special moves, as you can see, they stunt the growth of your attack string. Like, while my special moves are happening, I'm not building any meter, but now that I'm just doing regular attacks, my meter is building passively. So, different special moves actually stunt your meter growth differently. As you can see, Tanjiro's waterfall barely stunts it at all. Nearly as soon as I'm finished doing the waterfall, and the opponent just lies down, it's been like half a second and all of a sudden I'm in super building mode, not even just like regular charge, I'm in super breathing mode, which is not a case for most special moves. Like if I end in crazy scratching here, like it's been a while, I only just started getting my slow building and then it came into the full... Let's get a little bit more meter down. So it's been a while already and I only just started building my meter. So it really depends on each special move. Some characters, it can be really, really noticeable, but most of the time you're not really going to notice it. Pre-patch Akaza was appalling, because every special move he did, he had to wait like a full three seconds before he built any meter afterwards. It was horrendous. So, um, yeah, kind of as a base rule, spending any meter on a special move will take longer for you to build meter back than spending meter in any other way. So if I spend meter on a dash cancel, whether it's an aerial dash cancel, like to put the opponent in the air, or if I spend the meter on a jump cancel or a sidestep cancel, 
that's going to take less time to build me back meter than a special move. Just as a general rule of thumb, obviously there are exceptions like Waterfall, but usually special moves take longer to build meter back than doing other forms of cancels like dash cancels. And also, just from character to character, different characters have different meter rebuild timers. So, if I just do an attack and jump cancel it with Tanjiro and Zenitsu at the exact same time, watch what happens. They jumped, and they attacked and jumped at the same time, and Zenitsu started way earlier than Tanjiro did. Let me walk a little further away so we don't hit each other. Even if I was a little off with the timing, it's pretty obvious how much earlier Zenitsu starts than Tanjiro does. And the same, the same isn't the case for like all characters. Like these two characters, they're about the same. If Inosuke's jump is a little bit quicker, so he'll start like a tiny bit beforehand. But if we have him, so they land at about the same time, and they'll start breathing at the same time. So all the characters are slightly different. But Zenitsu is iconically one of the characters that builds meter faster than others. So he starts like a full half second. It's pretty cool and it's pretty important for characters um, especially like Zenitsu here. Like after he does his flash it's good that he builds meter way quicker than other characters or else he'd never get a chance to build his meter. So that's something to think about with your characters. Think about how quickly they build meter and think about try each of your special moves in training mode and kind of watch how long it takes for you to build meter back off of them. Does it change depending on what special move you do? Or is your character like beneficial enough for them to all be amazing? Like look at Zenitsu's. The air spin, it's got a little bit of wait time but then he goes straight into the supercharge whereas Nezuko, after she did something, she had to wait a long time. Like, let's get try Nosuke. He's still waiting, he's still- that was a lot longer than Zenitsu had to wait. So it changes from character and it changes from special move to special move. So really watch it and, yeah, think about it when you're using your special moves like, oh damn, if I use this special move, it's gonna take me a long time to get meter back. Or, maybe if I've used a special move that takes me a long time to get meter back, like pretend this move used, took a long time, just do another meter spend and then it's only the most previous meter spend that actually counts. So, uh, yeah, interesting little stuff if you want to really think about every nitty gritty little thing when you're thinking about strategy, but it's pretty powerful. And obviously on the surface level, all this stuff is really important. Just thinking about meter management and going for hard knockdowns to build back meter is a really important strategy that, that I don't see enough people using. It's very, very important, guys. So now that we're talking about meter, I think we should talk about how to use your super meter at the bottom of the screen. And um, I guess the obvious is the ultimate, but we've kind of already mentioned them. Your ultimate, it's invincible. You can just use it like a DP, you use it to end combos, does a big chunk of damage. It has, does different amounts of damage at level 1, 2, and 3. That's your ultimate. Big chunk of damage, it's invincible. Pretty cool. But things that are more cool is boost mode. So if you go into boost mode, you spend one bar of your meter, so if you're on three, it'll go down to two. If you just have one, it'll go to empty, um, like so. And it starts this little timer that starts going down. Your character gets some more particle effects, and there's a flame on the bottom of the screen beside the timer. So the timer is doesn't get shortened by anything. It's just literally a timer showing how much more time you have in boost mode. And boost mode is basically just a very simple power-up mode. It just makes your character's attacks do more damage, it gives them far cooler particle effects, and it also gives you a follow-up to your standing attack string. For some characters, this is a really, really handy follow-up, and for others, not so much. Tanjiro is kind of in the middle ground. He has, you know, his follow-up can be pretty useful. He can only, he can do this full combo, it only costs him two bars. And there's about half of the opponent's life, which is pretty amazing. And it's got a bit of a hard knockdown, so he can build back a bunch of meter before the opponent wakes up. So that's pretty damn powerful. So Tanjiro is a character that's pretty good in boost mode. And not only does boost mode give you um, more damage to your special move and your attacks and gives you an extra follow-up to your attacks, it also lets you build all of your meter back. So if you've been a bit crazy, you haven't been following me, my advice of building back your meter with a hard knockdown, and you're like, oh crap, I have no meter. Well, you can just pop a boost at any time and then it builds all of it back instantly and you've got all of your gauge so you can go for some crazy damaging combos 
with just lots of special moves in them, and your opponent's probably just gonna die even from that. Um, if they haven't died, then you have the option to go into Surge mode, and we'll, we'll get into that in a second. But just talking about the boost mode activation, it's actually a really useful activation, because if I'm just blocking and the opponent's attacking me, I can just pop boost at any time. It kind of works just like a pushback. You can just do it literally whenever you're in guard stun. It's really amazing. The opponent will just get zoomed backwards. So I honestly think it's like a best thing to do. Like you just throw all the meter you have and then you do some things on your minus. And like I do a water wheel on block maybe. And then as Yonosuke tries to take me back, I build back all of my meter and go into boost mode. And now he's launched down and he has to deal with my craziness. Like, oh, that simple thing did so much damage. And if somehow the boost mode isn't ridiculous enough for you, there is surge mode. I mean, I think we all know at this point. You get infinite meter, you oh, get so much damage from your special moves. And characters like T Water Tanjiro that can just link special move after special move, I think you know exactly what you're going to be doing in this mode. You have infinite meter, your special moves do more damage, so why wouldn't you do this? Oh, also, not only do you have infinite meter and your special moves do more damage, you also get armor on your special moves and everything that you do. Like, wh what? Why? Why do we need armor on top of all of this ridiculousness? It's pretty crazy. And uh, yeah, so Surge is... If you've activated Surge in a game, like, it must have been a rough game and you're needing to make a lot of a comeback because Surge is really throwing it to the opponent. That means you've gone through boost mode, being in this mode where you get super ridiculous pretty cheap combos. I didn't even use the combo extender there, I completely forgot about it. But you've done this, and you've had lots of time in this mode, and then you've chosen to go into surge mode, where you get all of your meter back, and you have unlimited meter. You've just basically spent the entire game with meter, and now you have armor on everything you do. Like, your opponent is dead. So, yeah, boost and surge mode are kind of OP, but do take into account that activation for each of them both cost a bar of meter. So I was on three bars at the beginning of this, but now I'm only on one. And, um... Luckily, with that one, I can throw an ultimate during surge mode if I want to. And um, if the boost mode activation wasn't kind of awesome enough, the surge mode activation can be even more powerful because it can actually be used to punish things. So like, as soon as you get hit by something that usually wouldn't be punishable, you can activate surge mode and you completely nullify any block stun that you would have been stuck faced in. You, like, you would have just been standing there in block stun. Like, take, for example, something that's usually advantageous. Like, um, I don't know, maybe... Wait, let me... Boost mode. And maybe Inosuke's... This is advantageous on block. Not anymore, because I can just pop surge mode whenever I'm in boost mode, and basically anything that the opponent does to me on block is a punish if I react to it. Like, uh, that's kind of ridiculous. It, it is kind of ridiculous, it, it is. So make sure, if you have lots of meter, you put it to use, because in this game, you can use your meter, and you can make it worthwhile using that meter. Definitely, it's terrifying. But, um... I think that's about it, talking about those two modes. Obviously, most of the touch of death and Twitter TOD combos that you see are going to be using surge mode because it leads to ridiculous stuff, ridiculous damage. But um, it doesn't just have to be a, a Twitter clip move. If you save your meter and don't just do random ultimates at the end of the game that waste a bunch of meter, you're probably going to be able to use it in round two or three. It's pretty cool stuff. Okay, I think it's about time we talk about frame data kind of language in this game. Obviously, you can't call it frame data because you don't have the frame data for the actual moves. You don't know if that's like 10 frames, 6 frames, 15 frames. You, know, you can make guesses, but it's quite harder in 3D games like this. But you still have the basics and fundamentals of something being advantageous on block, or something being minus on block, something being punishable on block, or something being in minus on hit, advantageous on hit, there's a lot of words, and if you don't understand what those mean, it can be very confusing when you hear other people saying it, obviously. And um, it's just good to understand them so that you know when you're doing things, you're doing them because it's advantageous on block or something, blah 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 blah, and you know how to express yourself. 
So, advantage means it's still your turn and the frames are in your favor. So, to start off, one of the ones you probably hear the most is advantage on block, because it's one of the most useful ones and something that is really important to moves that is an aspect about them. What, what am I saying? So, if Inosuke blocks Tanjiro's waterfall, a really important aspect of that is the waterfall is advantage on block, or it is plus on block. Both of those terms mean that it is still Tanjiro's turn when Inosuke blocks the waterfall. Tanjiro can attack before Inosuke can attack, so it is still Tanjiro's turn. It's actually so much Tanjiro's turn that Inosuke needs to do a pushback in order to just do anything against the waterfall. So that's pretty crazy. Another thing that is advantage on block, or plus on block, is a dash in. After you land a dash in and Inosuke blocks it, Tanjiro can actually attack before Inosuke can, which means that it's still your turn and that's why you're at advantage on block. Inosuke blocked, but it's still your advantage. Something that is minus on block, or disadvantageous on block, is a water wheel. Even though it's not punishable, Inosuke can attack before I can, and even though I was mashing the attack button there, Inosuke won because he attacked before I could. Inosuke doesn't necessarily win that encounter automatically though, like as a punish, because as you can see here, Tanjiro can block before Inosuke's attack actually hits him, he just can't attack before Inosuke attacks him. So, just to refresh, advantage means it's still your turn, disadvantage means it isn't your turn, and it can just be unique in certain situations, knowing whether you are at advantage or disadvantage. So after Waterfall, Tanjiro's still at advantage. After Water Wheel, he's not at advantage. But after Whirlpool, he's at serious disadvantage. He is punishable on block. He is so disadvantageous, and Inosuke can attack so much longer before Tanjiro can, the Tanjiro doesn't even have time to block before Inosuke can attack. So Inosuke can attack before Tanjiro even blocks, that's what makes the move punishable. So you know, Tanjiro does this, and before he can even press the block button, Inosuke is attacking him. And now, now that you understand this terminology, we can talk about moves like this. So the first few hits of your attack string are actually advantageous on hit, whereas the last one, like that hit there, and the last hit, are actually not advantageous on hit. Inosuke can attack me before I can attack him back. As you can see there, even though Inosuke missed, Inosuke attacked before Tanjiro did. As you can see there, even though I've hit Inosuke, I'm actually disadvantage even on hit, on the hit of my regular attacks and the second last and last hit of my attack string, I'm actually at disadvantage, so you don't ever want to just leave your attack string like this, because your opponent can just actually outmash you. So that's an example of being disadvantageous on hit, whereas your water wheel is advantageous on hit, but it's not advantageous enough to be a combo on hit. It's just advantage, so Inosuke can block here, but it's still my turn. There's no chance that Inosuke can press buttons before I can. I'm at far too much of an advantage. You see, you see how this word works now? Just, if I have advantage, it's my turn to press buttons. If I have disadvantage, it's not my turn to press buttons. If I'm at serious disadvantage, my opponent can attack me before I can even block. And if I'm at serious advantage on block, I can attack before they can even stop blocking, so Inosuke is forced to keep blocking here unless he does a push block or something. So, yeah, frame data is really important, and it's important that you know these terminologies, so that when you say things like, oh, how did you mash there? Or like, oh, why were you mashing there? I'm advantageous on block, you're so stupid, why would you mash there? You know that you can say, I'm plus on block, I'm advantageous on block, so they actually make sense, you know what you're talking about. So yeah, that's the basics of frame data in this game, and um, I guess if we're also talking about not just advantage and disadvantage of actual hits, you can talk about of an individual move having long startup, you, or you can talk about, talk about the startup, the active, and the recovery frames of each move. Startup is how long it takes a move 
to actually enter a hit phase, so when it can actually hit the opponent. Something with short startup would be your regular attack. Look how quick that was before it hit the opponent. It's like a blink of the eye and it hit Inosuke. Something that would be a little bit slower is my waterfall. Look how long I had to do that jump into the air. I can blink after it happens and it still hasn't hit Inosuke. It takes, because you know, it's, it's a longer, it's a bigger move, but it has more startup. And recovery is what happens... Oh, wait, nope. We went from startup, and then after startup you have active frames. So how many active frames a move has is how long is the move able to hit the opponent for when it's out. So my regular attack has very few active frames. I do it and it kind of has to hit him the instant the move happens or else it's just not going to hit him. Unlike the water wall, the water wheel, which has a lot of active frames, because even though I miss it at the very start, like I can mix it at the very start, the opponent can still get hit by it. Unlike my regular attack, if I miss it at the very start, it's gone, it's dead. It doesn't have any active frames, it's got like two active frames probably. Whereas my water wheel has like 50, so like a few frames later, all of a sudden Inosuke can walk into it and get hit by it. Same thing goes for my waterfall, it's active that whole time it's on the screen, and it's on the screen for a longer time than this attack. And then, obviously, the last thing is recovery frames, and recovery frames is how long it takes before you are set back to neutral, how long before you can block. So a good example of that is the whirlpool, and as you can see there, I'm holding the block button after I do whirlpool, and you can see the amount of time after I do the whirlpool before Tanjiro goes back into the blocking animation, all that time is recovery frames. So how long it takes me to get back to be able to block or to take any other action. And that's important because if something has a lot of recovery, that basically means it's unsafe and the opponent can punish you for it. If it has really little recovery, that means that you're probably at advantage. So like this waterfall for some reason has really little recovery. I recover so fast after doing it that I can attack the opponent before they can attack me. And so it's just a different way of talking about frame data in a more fluid way. Yeah, so I hope you enjoyed that little rant about frame data. Let's talk about normal stuff for a 3D fighter now. Okay, I think the next topic is pretty, pretty common for a 3D fighter, and that's the neutral. Because that's kind of what these games are all based about, because you've got a three-dimensional neutral. You've got ups, you've got your jumps, and you can also walk around in a, in a whole plane, not just back and forward. So, pretty privileged. So, the neutral in fighting games is this situation that I'm kind of in right now with Inosuke. No one is currently attacking the opponent. If Inosuke was attacking me, this isn't neutral right now. If I'm attacking Inosuke, or if I'm even comboing Inosuke, this is not the neutral. The neutral is when no one has the immediate advantage and you're kind of just all both walking around each other, seeing who makes a move and who makes the wrong move and who decides to go in first. It's kind of the, like, in wrestling when people try and get each other to flinch or, like, do whatever and who makes... Who takes the first hit that's what the neutral is and it happens a lot of the time in in fighting games and you have to make sure you play the neutral well or else you're gonna get demolished and your opponent is always gonna be the one comboing you so in the neutral you have to think about things like mm, how far do my opponent's attacks reach what options does my opponent have at these different distances that i can place myself in if i'm a zona character like yahaba it's pretty easy for me i can just be like well I'm a character that wants to be very far away, so I'm going to go far away and stand over here and throw my projectiles from very far away. The neutral is pretty simple for Yahaba, because he knows exactly what he wants to do. He wants to be far away, he wants to throw his projectiles, and he wants to hit you with his rocks. For characters like swordsmen against each other, it becomes a little bit complex because we both want the same thing. We both want to be close enough to get a hit, but we don't want to get hit ourselves. And when we both have the same length swords, that can be pretty difficult. And it's all about who makes what decisions and who thought about the other decision of the other opponent. So in the neutral, me and Inosuke can be just like walking around, like jumping, sidestepping, faking out dashes and stuff like this. And a really easy way to go through the neutral in this game, and it's kind of just built into the fundamentals, is dashing in. I have the option at any time I'm standing here just to launch myself at the opponent, and if they don't block, well then boom, I get to get a full combo on them and they start dying. But um, even if they block my dash in, well, it's still my turn and now I get to be attacking them and I'm still on the offensive and I'm kind of winning this situation right now. So. Dashing in seems like a really, really good option for beating the neutral. But 
when you both have the same option, you have to think about it. Because if you if you know the opponent is going to dash in, I, if you know that you can dash in and that's such a great option, because you can get a combo from it, or even if they block it, you can get um, pressure on their guard, obviously the opponent's going to be thinking about that as well. So you're both going to really want to be dashing in on each other, because that gets you a lot of reward. But dashing in can kind of be beaten. So if you the opponent knows I'm going to dash in, well then, why... if <laughs> like, if I know Inosuke is going to dash in, why wouldn't I just go for an armored attack or something? So I know Inosuke is going to do a dash, I can just do this, and they, he runs at me like an idiot, and I get to beat him, because I knew that he wanted to go for that, and I mainly knew that because I wanted to go for it too. So the neutral is all about making reads and predicting what your opponent's going to do, and thinking about their actions, and reflecting on what they've done before. If you know they're just going to dash in every single time, you can stand there. You can even go for parries to get stuff like this going. But um, then you have the option, thankfully with the dash, of faking it out. So you can cancel your dash. So this is where it becomes the you know that I know that you know that I know kind of stuff. So we both know that we want to dash in and say I've just been dashing in a lot against Inosuke in this game. I just keep dashing in any opportunity I get. I just dash in on him whether he blocks it or not and I keep attacking him. Just pressure, pressure, pressure. But he starts to know that and then Inosuke, after I'm dashing in, starts to do invincible special moves to beat me or an armored attack to beat me or whatever. He starts beating my dash in. But now that I know that he knows I'm gonna dash in. So I know that he is aware that I'm gonna dash in and he's beating it. I know that now, so I can fake out my dash in. I can pretend like I'm just doing the same thing over and over again that I've been doing the entire game, but I can actually cancel it and I can just stop and make it look like I'm dashing in. And then maybe if I do that and I cancel it, is gonna go for the boar rush anyways or go for his invincible special move anyways to beat me. But then I actually didn't do it, so I ended up beating him. And this, this kind of mind games is the essence of neutrals. It's kind of rock, paper, scissors in space. Because it's, it's rock, paper, scissors about how much distance is between you and how you're going to approach. So with my fake out, I can obviously just, you know, do that. I can even go in for a grab then if I think he's going to be really careful about my dash in. Like, oh, what if he cancels it out? I'm just going to wait here. Well, what if I just dash in and grab you? What are you going to do then, huh? So it's all about thinking about what options the opponent has and where it becomes matchup wise relevant is what moves does the opponent have that can completely obliterate me. Tanjiro has an option, the water wheel. It used to be a lot better, but um, now it's, it still does the job, it's just not as excellent. But it, it reaches really far, it has a super long hitbox and it has has, has a super long active frames and it hit its hitbox is around Tanjiro so it's really hard to counter him. So you can't really hit him out of it or like none of your hits will win. So you really have to armor through it if you want to beat him because if he does hit you with it, you're going to die. So you have to be thinking about him wanting to do that. Maybe I'm someone that likes to jump in the air and dash in. I have to be watching for someone who wants to jump in the air and dash in. And if I think someone's going to jump in the air, well, I can actually water wheel them because that'll, that's a really good anti-air. If you're fighting against Sinezuko, you have to watch out for the heel bash because it's just a flip kick that launches her in on the opponent kind of just like the dash in except it goes in the air and she gets to launch herself in on the opponent and if she gets a hit she gets a combo if she doesn't if the opponent blocks it she still gets to go in for a full combo or she's advantageous on block it's like oh it's a win-win scenario so you need to think about what the opponent's doing and think about the countermeasures to everything because everything has an option to beat it whether the options are great or not, they're always there. <laughs> so against Nezuko's heel flip, you don't really have too many options other than maybe dodging it, because you can dodge out of the way, then she's just awkwardly heel flip beside it, but you do have to be careful because its hitbox is big. Or you just have the option of knowing when she's going to do it and armor through it. Or you have the option of kind of staying at this, this distance. So if I'm Minosuke now, I kind of want to stay this distance around Nezuko and stay just a little bit outside of the range of her heel flip because I know she can just pop a heel flip any time but if I'm staying around this distance her flip heel flip isn't going to reach and then if I react if I did the right attack I could have dashed in and punished her trying to do the heel flip from the wrong distance so if I'm like waiting around over here and just like walking in on her like faking out my dash in and stuff and oops that was not a fake out at all but like doing stuff like this and she decides just to pop a heel flip I can dash in and punish her for that and that's countermeasure you can take against her heel flip. 
So everything has a countermeasure, whether it's directly countering it with literal armor or invincibility, or whether you're countering the space that it takes up on the screen and you're making sure you're staying out of the range of someone to pop a ridiculous strong attack, or you're thinking about the rock, paper, scissors scenario of what someone likes to do. So if Tanjiro that I'm fighting against tends to really like just popping a run, I can think about going for a parry whenever I see a run or armoring through the run. Or if I know he likes to do a lot of run fakeouts, well I can think about not really caring about the run because he's just going to do nothing. Or if I think he does run up grabs, I can jump out of the way. And... There is a lot of facets to neutral. And when you when we say a tool is really powerful in neutral, it's kind of an example like Nezuko's. Nezuko's heel flip is a really powerful tool in neutral because it kind of beats so many other options and it beats so many mind games it kind of forces your game because as long as she's in range for heal bash she's basically winning the neutral because she can just throw this anytime and whether you block it or you get hit by it she's winning because she's either advantageous on block or getting a combo and you're losing the game right now buddy <laughs> even though i keep dropping that combo but uh yeah so this move is really good in the neutral so you have to be really careful of it and characters that are good in the neutral are obviously going to be your zoners or your people with really long range buttons like Rui because then he's really has awesome neutral around this range where characters usually can't hit buttons his buttons would be hitting and that leads to really good neutral and when you're talking about players having good neutral or bad neutral we're talking about what kind of decisions they make in neutral so if we're looking at like the online water wheel spamming tanjiros you'd say their neutral is not so good because they're very predictable in neutral like, if you know he's always going to be doing the same thing, his neutral isn't very good because his neutral is the same thing all the time and you could, it's very easy to counter. Good neutral is being unpredictable, it's about being uh, unpredictable, it's about thinking about what the opponent is doing as well. It's not just you forcing your neutral, it's about you not getting hit by the opponent's neutral and their tools that they have to get in on you. And yeah, it's about being unreliable, it's about mixing it up. It's about making the opponent scared of you from any distance because you have so many options, you do so many random things, they never know what you're going to do next. And it's about you not only implying that and applying your offensive neutral, but making sure that you counter theirs and you beat them at theirs. If I think Inosuke is going to dash in, I'm going to beat him, but I'm going to do a parry and make him really suffer that. Yeah, that's my unhinged rant on the neutral, where I probably said that word way too many times for it to ever be a drinking game, because one would just die. But uh, thanks for coming to my TED talk, I think I should move on to the next topic. And just to quickly mention the two kind of archetypes of gameplay in this game, currently it's kind of just rushdown and zoning. All of the Demon Slayer characters with swords and even including Nezuko, she falls into this category too. A character that just want to rush you down, they want to be in your face, they want to do their combos, they want to pressure you, they want to be up close. These are rushdown characters, obviously. But there are new some newly introduced characters that would more fall into the zoning category. That is obviously the likes of Yahaba and Susamaru, and maybe even Enmu, but Enmu's kind of a bit more iffy. These characters can be very controversial in their gameplay because they like to just be as far away from a rushdown character as they can and then they do their pressure from full screen. They thrive from full screen. They do their best at full screen. He gets most of his dam- Yahava actually gets more damage from far away than he gets from up close, which is kind of ridiculous. So it makes sense that he wants to be far away. And in zoning archetypes, they just want to- Their neutral is pretty simple because their neutral is just like- do whatever they can and build distance while they're do dealing damage and it makes it pretty easy for them. Whereas Demon Slayer characters, they have to close distance very carefully against rushdown characters, but the idea is that when rushdown characters get in on zoning characters, that they're a lot more powerful than the zoning characters up close. Which for cases like Enmu and stuff, who has an amazing reversal and great buttons and stuff, doesn't really apply. But that's why I think Enmu would more fall into the like rushdown setup kind of character. He just happens to have some nice projectiles that can be used sometimes for spacing. But he's not really a projectile heavy character. He only has the aerial projectiles and the meter spent projectiles. And I don't think I would call Akaza as owner as well. He's just a rushdown character who has good spacing with projectiles. 
So yeah, rushdown is getting in your face, going for mix-ups, pressure, combos, and grabs. And zoning is building distance and dealing damage from afar and pressuring your opponent from afar. Two pretty opposing archetypes, and no wonder it creates so much drama when the two meet. There's also one thing that I think is really important to be aware of, because when it does pop off, it kind of seems like it should be a glitch, but that's the fact that characters have landing invincibility, or landing invulnerability. So whenever a character lands when they're jumping, or even when they're landing when they're being hit, so after Rui here lands after being airborne, if when he lands there, he's invincible for a little bit. Invincible for quite a number of frames, where if I try to press some buttons, he can actually press buttons and beat me. As you can see there, he can actually press buttons before I can, and that's not because he can pr start pressing buttons before I can, it's because I started pressing buttons first, but my button went straight through him, even if we were facing a wall. As you can see there, my attack came out first, but because he's invincible as he lands, that attack missed. So that can lead to some really awkward situations. And one of them, you know, even counts with Rui. So when Ru Rui is doing a combo and say he's ended like this, he's done a few hits and ended like that. That grab should have hit the opponent, but the opponent was actually invincible as they landed, so the grab didn't hit. And as you can see, that first swipe of his just went straight through the opponent. And in these situations, it doesn't matter too much, it just makes your resets a little bit annoying and finicky. But there are some characters where this really... where this bug kind of really, really annoys them. And Makamo is a great example of that, because, um, watch this. So, if she just wants to do a simple combo, and, you know, maybe the person playing her isn't used to how Makamo's combos work, you wouldn't know that her full attack string actually drops against airborne opponents most of the time because the opponent actually lands before she does the spinning thing. And in most games that wouldn't be a problem if the opponent lands like before she does that, it would just be a cool restand. But in this game, the opponent lands and is invincible, so let me just show you what that means. Not only can the opponent block halfway through the sequence, but they can also do this. Rui is so invincible that he actually has time to take an action before he is able to be hit. He can hit her during his invincibility, so in the middle of her combo, he just happens to accidentally land and hit the floor, and because of that, he's able to mash out of the combo and he could have done whatever the heck he likes. Is that not kind of strange to you? Like, even though even though the, he landed, and maybe even if he was able to block there, it's weird that he is not just able to like fall out of the combo and then you know she kind of drops the combo because he lands on the ground and the timing's a bit weird no he's full-on invincible suddenly in the middle of her combo so much so that he's able to punish her during her combo while she's still attacking because randomly he just became invincible and it's just stuff like that that makes for really really weird sequences and situations in combos and resets and it's something you need to be aware of uh i'm not a fan of it but you have to make sure you know it's there Okay, and one final tip that isn't actually about the game's mechanics itself, but it's about the settings of the game. And I think it's really important that you think about how you want your buttons to be mapped in this game, because the way they're mapped by default kind of isn't the most helpful. By default, the dash button is circle on PlayStation, like B on Xbox, which I guess is okay if you're just using it as a dash and you know, you dash in like that. But when you're using your dash, like the sidestep is the same button as your dash, it can be really awkward to go like sidestep with circle and then move your finger to somewhere else on the keypad. What I really like to use for dash and sidestep is left trigger because games that I play like Guilty Gear Strive have a map dash button and I use the dash button as the left trigger. So it feels really natural for me that other games use the same movement stick. And um, yeah, it just makes it a lot more easy to move. Like you can do jump instant air sidestep a lot more easily than if you were on here and you have to like go from you jump in the air and you go x circle x circle x circle triangle just to do some things in the air where if you can just go jump trigger jump trigger jump trigger 
it's so much easier and it is really easy for dashing in. Just having it on a completely different hand and different finger makes it way more easy to do inputs and stuff like that. So just think about how you want your buttons to be mapped. I have everything else the same and I just have my boost mapped to circle and it works really well for me. So make sure you have a think about that and it could really, really boost your gameplay. And before we finish, I think we should definitely talk about what makes demons different in the game Demon Slayer Hinokami Chronicles. Because they are different and they were added on after the game was released, so there's, there's some special things about them. So the first thing you've probably noticed is that demons fight alone. They don't have a sidekick or a support Demon Slayer character. They fight on their own, they can't choose other demons, and they can only also only fight on nighttime maps. Not that that affects gameplay or anything. So, as you can see, where they would have a support in the top left of the screen, they just have two orange bars, and kind of just as if they had a support, they can press the button in the exact same way. So pressing the, the support button for a demon does their demon skills. If I just press it normally with the Kaza, it'll do a special move called Collapse, and it'll just use up one of your support bars, just as if I called out Nezuko to do her flip kick. So it's just like doing a different special move, but it stays the same as your character and it just gives you more abilities. And if I do my tilt demon skill, it's this really cool armored attack. So they're generally very powerful moves because they have, they use your support meter. And as you know, if you don't have support meter, you can't break out of combos like Yahaba can here. And it works just the same as like if you had a support, you just press the button and you get to break out of the combo. So that's why you want to be careful not to use your support gauge too much for combos or whatever, because then if you get hit in a combo, you can't break out of it. Now, one other super special thing about demons is Yahaba right now is going to go into boost mode. And you'll see that he actually has this white gauge at the top left of the screen. And he's building life back. So when demons go into boost mode, not only do they get the extra attack string and the bonus damage on all of their meter and get all of their meter back, they also get potential health back. They get regenerating health, which is really amazing. And if they go into boost mode again, or go into surge mode, they get an extra chunk of life that they can back get back. So in total, they can get about 50% of their life, as well as meter like three times it around if you decide to go into boost and surge mode. So just know that those aspects are very, very powerful for demons. Going into boost mode and then surge mode, you can get 50% of your life. And obviously, going into those things also restores your support gauge or your demon skill gauge, which can be really important, because if you've used it a bunch, like Akaza has used it all in his combos, so you want to make sure that you can get it back by doing your boost, and then when you go into boost, you also happen to get some health back. So just make sure you think about those things when you're playing demons. There's not too much different to demons other than the fact that they don't have, you know, supports they can throw out, obviously, but they are very fun characters, and their differences make them unique and fun. But those are demons. They're pretty awesome. Okay, and now that concludes this marathon-long informational video. I hope by watching through the entire thing, which if you did, applause to you. Applause to you. Good job. But I hope from watching through this entire video, you have learned a bunch of things. Hopefully not just a few. I hope you've learned a ton of things, because you were committed to watching this entire video. And I thank you very dearly for doing so, because it makes me really happy knowing that I've helped people or I've taught people some things I didn't know. So, whether you started off watching this video as a beginner or an intermediate player, hopefully now your brain is exploding with ideas and concepts that you didn't have in there before, and now you're ready to go and beat some ass online in Demon Slayer Hinokami Chronicles. Thank you very, very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye!